Bueno, vamos a, a iniciar esta última sesión de nuestra Cátedra Gauss 2019. Yo debo decir que cuando el Consejo Interno decidió invitar a Manuel Vargas, no lo hicimos pensando que, que viniera a hablar sobre el texto. Yo sí pensé eso. Yo sí, era una posibilidad, pero no le dijimos ah, que no, no, viniera a hablar sobre el texto. Ya eso es... siempre piensa lo que nadie más piensa. ¿no? Es, sí, es una locura. Exacto. Que... Sí, yo, yo estaba ahí y vi otra cosa. ¿eh? Bueno, nosotros estamos. Este, As usual. Libre As usual, usual exacto. Con free will y cosas de ese tipo, que también trabaja muy bien. O sea, eso fue una decisión ¿no? que, que, que tomó el propio Manuel y nos pareció muy bien. Ahora, que, que, que lo haya hecho me parece una decisión muy importante para reevaluar nuestra, nuestra propia tradición, nuestro propio pasado, como lo señalaba Guillermo Hurtado en la última sesión. ¿no? Que alguien del prestigio de Manuel aborde con todo profesionalismo las grandes figuras de, de nuestro pasado filosófico pues representa un, un paso muy importante para la visibilidad del de, de trabajo filosófico en México. Yo me siento muy agradecido y en nombre del Instituto también digo que estamos muy agradecidos con Manuel por haber aceptado esta invitación y por haberse atrevido a, a, a este, presentar el material que nos ofrece en, en, en México que no es una decisión sencilla porque claro que hay muchos celos profesionales ¿no? ¿cómo va a venir alguien de Estados Unidos a hablar de filosofía? Eh, pues muchas gracias Manuel y, y te doy la palabra gracias All right. um, thank you Pedro All right, so, so today uh, I think I'm going to do a couple of things differently so one is I'm going to be standing up here walking around And, uh, and, and hopefully, uh, because there, I'm not going to have a mic right in front of me, folks in the back can hear. Is that, am I projecting sufficiently well? Okay, so, uh, and if at some point my voice begins to fall off because the argument gets really shaky, um, you know, don't let me know. Uh, okay, so, uh, um, so today the other thing I guess worth noting is that, I, so I, as I was writing this up, I, I kept having the following thought. I'm not sure, today will either be the least or the most controversial of the six talks I, I'm giving. And I, I don't know yet what it's going to be. We'll find out when uh, it, I, either everybody leaves irritated at the beginning of question and answer or, uh, or they start throwing at me, uh, throwing things at me. I don't know. We'll find out. But before, uh, before I get to losing my audience, Uh, I want to start with some acknowledgments. Um, so first off, I, I uh, just want to thank Pedro and the Institute, all, um, all of you here, uh, for, for having me out. Uh, this was just a super exciting thing for me, and I'm really grateful to have had the opportunity to do it. It's been, uh, it's been a wonderful experience for me to be able to think about these issues and to think about and come and talk to the philosophers here, which in many ways I think uh, you folks are the best possible audience for uh, this set of thinking that I wanted to do. So I, I'm, I'm very grateful for having had the opportunity to do so. I also want to thank the audience. You here, if you're sitting here, quite apart from whether or not uh, you are related to Philosophicas in one way, shape, or form, thank you for your questions. Thank you for coming to listen. Thank you for putting up with my bad jokes and my, um, uh, my overly scrupulous attention to slides uh, rather than philosophical content. Okay, so, uh, and also I want to thank publicly Uh, Stephanie, Athena, Satya, and Nike Vargas, this is my family who puts up with my uh, disappearing to other countries for weeks at a time to come and, uh, and, and lecture. Uh, and uh, their own views are that, uh, that surely there's nothing I could be saying that would be sufficiently interesting to anybody <laughs> to be worth all of that time. But they, uh, they've been tremendously supportive of uh, a, uh, a very uh, intense crash course of working on this. So I want to thank my family for, for putting up with me and making all of this possible. Uh, also, I want to, uh, folks who aren't here in the room, but I got a lot of feedback in a relatively short amount of time. These lectures came together uh, more quickly than I'll admit to. Uh, and, uh, and Dan Speak, Clinton Tolley, and Carlos Sanchez uh, provided uh, substantial feedback at various stages in this project. And as with all of these things, no person is an island. We need communities to make our work go forward. And these folks have been really super helpful for me. And last, I, I want to just acknowledge everybody whose work uh, 
and shoulders I'm standing on to talk about these things. Uh, the, 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 there's a, a body of scholarship about this that has made it possible for me to, to read and think about these things and find tools to engage with. And some of those folks are, are, are in this room. Thank you, thank you, thank you for, uh, for the work that you've done that makes it possible for, for the rest of us to think about these things. So, um, so there we go. Okay, so here's the official plan for today. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk uh, open with uh, uh, the first part of the discussion will be reflections on uh, the philosophical legacy of Cervantes' Don Quixote. And, uh, and some of you may be wondering why, why am I in a, in a philosophy talk that's gonna be talking about Don Quixote? I'm gonna answer that question along the way. Then I'm gonna do some analytic philosophy of agency. And some of you are like, what? Um, I promise it'll all make sense. You just have to give me some time. Uh, and then I'm gonna conclude with a, uh, a potential future history of Mexican <laughs> philosophy. Okay, so, uh, so we're gonna do literature, uh, and some people will say philosophy, and then other people will say science fiction. Okay, so, uh, so that's the goal today. Um, all right, but here's what we're actually gonna do. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with what looks like intellectual history. And then just as you begin to nod off thinking, I don't really care about intellectual history, I'm a philosopher, then I'll sneak an argument in. And, uh, and hopefully you'll be so sleepy at that point you won't notice how controversial the argument is. Okay, so that's the plan. Um, so let's start off with the, I just hate saying quixotic meditations even though that's proper in English. But, um, but anyway, uh, we'll start off with some reflections on, on Don Quixote. So, uh, so I'm assuming that at least some of you have read Don Quixote. Um, hopefully many of you have read Don Quixote. Um, it turns out in English you can't assume that everybody's read Don Quixote. Uh, but, uh, but if you've not read it in a while, I promise you the book is even better than you remember it being. And if you've never read it, do yourself a favor and go and read it. It is truly a genuinely tremendous book. Uh, and, uh, and it's just, it's fantastic, and it's the kind of thing that if you're a philosopher and you haven't read it, you're really doing philosophy wrong. Um, that is, it, it's, it's just a tremendously rich book in a lot of different ways. Um, there's just, a, for example, I mean, this is just one small uh, aspect about the book. There's an enormous amount of, of, of metatextuality in the book. So Cervantes is a character in the book itself. Uh, there, there are dueling narrators, uh, uh, so there's just layers of, uh, of textual se separation going on that frame the book. Um, th one of the narrators is busy fighting with and contesting an alternative account of the story that was published by somebody else. Like the, uh, so this gets folded into the book and the, and the, the dia dialogue of the book itself. It's just it's tremendous. And it has what uh, Hannah Arendt calls exemplary validity. Uh, so Arendt's idea of exemplary validity is a piece of, of writing or an instance of, of some kind that when you see it or read it, et cetera, it is deeply about a place and a time, but that it's also universal. And in, in that sense, I think w when you read Don Quixote, it's clearly about Spain and it's about rural Spain and it's about rural Spain in a particular time and period, but the themes and the, uh, the individual kind of uh, human experiences that make up the story uh, resonate in a way that has, uh, that has a lot of extent way past uh, the kind of culturally specific moment in which uh, the story is taking place. And, and for my purposes, what I think is especially interesting is that the book wrestles with the value of the stories we tell ourselves. This is a central preoccupation of the text. That is, what are the values of the stories we tell ourselves? On what basis do we get people to accept those stories? On what basis do we contest those stories? When do we take those stories for granted? What are the conditions under which we challenge those stories? And so it's about, it's a story, of course, about stories uh, and the stories we tell ourselves and the way in which those stories enable social cooperation and social coordination in different kinds of ways. Okay, so that's the book. Uh, here's a, a couple of passages just to, to remind you. Uh, I'll pretend like we've all read it, so I'll just say to remind you of things that are, that are in the book. And of course, you all read the English language version. Um, th so, okay, so, um, though I guess I'm, I'm imagining that it actually, for some folks, it might be easier in English just because the Spanish is probably old enough that um, it's no, like, no? no? Okay, so uh, some of you are like, don't say such anathema. I'll, I'm just gonna say this about Shakespeare. Like Shakespeare is a pain in the ass to read for 21st century American English speakers. Like it doesn't read naturally, and I would love to read Shakespeare in translation over uh, Shakespeare in English at this point. Okay, uh, Senor Knight, we do not know this good lady that you have 
mentioned. He, um, so he's, uh, Don Quixote here is talking about Dulcinea. Um, show her to us, for if she is as beautiful as you say, we will gladly and freely confess the truth you ask of us. Because after all, Don Quixote is demanding of these people he's encountered that they all acknowledge that Dulcinea is the most beautiful and most virtuous woman in the world. And then he's, he replies with, if I were to show her to you, where would the virtue in your confessing so obviously a truth be? The significance lies in not seeing her and believing, confessing, affirming, swearing, and defending that truth. If you do not, you must do battle with me, All right? <laughs> this is just great. Um, okay, so I'll allow, I invite you to imagine other cases in which people um, it, uh, invite you to believe, confess, affirm, swear, and defend the truth of things that, uh, that one has not yet physically encountered. <laughs> uh, um, okay, second, uh, to conclude, he says, I imagine that everything, uh, uh, he says, and this is a, just a, it's a fantastic little passage. He says, I imagine that everything I say is true, no more and no less, and I depict her, Dulcinea again, in my imagination as I wish her to be in beauty and in distinction. Right? So, so here, this fictional object, in some sense, fictional object, Dulcinea, this fictional person, uh, he, he's up front. There's a kind of self-awareness, a recognition of, look, this is a kind of ideal I'm stipulating for certain kinds of purposes, but it's an ideal that I'm stipulating for certain kinds of purposes that, I'm de that it's very important that I depict my ideal in a specific kind of way. And then, uh, very late in the book, so it was like almost 700 pages in at this point on uh, uh, that uh, there's this moment when a, an actual duke and duchess are, uh, are interacting with Don Quixote and they've told their entire household to treat Don Quixote as though he were in fact a knight. Uh, and, uh, and so in this moment, uh, then, uh, th then this, this uh, Cervantes tells us this, or the narrator anyway tells us this. Uh, all of them, or most of them, sprinkled flagons of perfumed water on Don Quixote and on the Duke and the Duchess, all of which astounded Don Quixote. And this was the first day he really knew and believed he was a true knight. Now, I think this is a startling and amazing passage in the book, partly because, as you know from the basic plot of the story, Don Quixote is a guy who, at the very beginning of the, the, the novel, is a landowner but falls in love with reading uh, uh, chivalric literature and decides that maybe he should go and reenact and live as a knight. And it's a little unclear at the beginning about whether or not he's just mentally ill or whether or not there's something else going on in the story. And, and, and people tend to react to him in the early parts of the story as though he was just, uh, he was is just a crazy old man. But over time, people come to get sucked into the narrative in various kinds of ways and tend to adopt and respond to him in roles and personas that reflect his adamant insistence and living out and enacting the role of a knight errant. Uh, and so, uh, so part of what's interesting about this is that at 700 pages in, we get an answer to the question, did Don Quixote believe he really was a knight? And the answer is, Don Quixote didn't start off believing he was a knight, but by around page 700, he comes to, for the first time, believe he's a knight because people have started to respond and treat him in that way. So this is, I think it's a super fascinating, really interesting bit, uh, bit of the text. So a couple simple observations about this. So in Don Quixote, roles, norms, roles and norms are highlighted as constructed. They're fungible. They can be changed. But, the, but it, we're repeatedly reminded of the constructed nature of these things. Our social categories and social roles can be contested. They can be transformed. You can reinvoke old categories and use them again. But they're always tied to a place and a time. And that's part of what's initially shocking in Don Quixote is the idea of knights errant and the whole business about chivalry and so on was long dead by the time he's living out these sorts of things. So he's a man out of time in some sense in the story. But over time comes to pull back a, a set of social structures that support and enact that kind of, uh, that kind of role. So at the beginning, he's, he's regarded as a gentleman, and, then, you know, and, and people put up with it, but then they think he's a confused old man. And by the end of the book, people are regularly responding to him and acting uh, as though he were, in fact, a knight. And, this, and his insistence on himself being a knight and acting as though he's a knight eventually elicits partial cooperation. That is, he increasingly gets more and more cooperation from people uh, reacting to him as though he were a knight. And interestingly, I think, and this is one of the things I think that is um, 
a, uh, a super kind of interesting and subtle observation that Cervantes does is that the relationships that, that Don Quixote has with people, initially, many of the relationships are ones in which people adopt what P.F. Strassen and Friedemann Renzetten calls the objective stance. They regard the person as a target for, uh, for manipulation. They're not re responding with reactive emotions to the person, but they just think, oh, no, no, no this is a crazy person who needs to be tr uh, taken as, a, as an object of treatment. Right, so so uh, you might think something like, uh, you know, think about the, uh, the the kind of therapeutic context. The therapeutic context, the therapist doesn't uh, doesn't respond to you in the same way that uh, a person might if you were to be expressing anger or being upset at the therapist, etc. The therapist has a certain kind of uh, distance from you and sees you as an object of treatment. And uh, and and oftentimes we do this when we encounter people with whom we think, okay, this is a person I'm not going to react to as a fellow person. This is a person I. Just just have to deal with and in whatever the most efficient possible way for me to do that is, and I'm not, I'm not going to get emotionally involved. But what's interesting is that uh, though a lot of people start off with a kind of objective stance uh, uh, to this guy who shows up wearing a barber's bowl for a hat and, uh, and, and outdated armor and you know insisting that Rocinante, his, his old nag, is in fact a, a mighty steed, uh, this sort of thing, uh, they, they put up with initially and treat him as though he's an object of treatment, but that come to then have more and and more and richer complicated emotional reactions to him uh, the longer they engage with him and the more they see uh, a certain kind of um, commitment and uh, genuine interest in living out the kinds of forms of lives and, and, and norms that, that he carries with him. And then, uh, as we saw in that last bit of the, the quotation I put up in front of you before, he has an ambivalent awareness about his own constructions. That is, and here by constructions I mean his insistence that he's a knight, that he plays these certain kinds of roles, and they aren't mere fictions for him, right? So it's not that they're mere fictions in the sense in which, uh, you know, I might dress up as Batman for Halloween and then tell everybody, uh, no, really, I'm Bruce Wayne. Uh, that all of that would be a giant fiction that might be fun for entertainment purposes, but it's not a mere fiction for Don Quixote in the sense that these are constructions that shape his life and give meaning to his actions and that give meaning to his interactions with other people. And they're pretty resilient, uh, and he sometimes seems to be aware and sometimes not about just how much it is a construction. So this is why I said uh, that the content of the social practices are central to meaning making. So that is, th there are these social practices and social practices of knighthood. Uh, they drive the social meaning of what the acts are. That is, is he acting gallantly or is he acting stupidly? Uh, is he acting with chivalry or is he acting uh, crazy? All of this, the social meaning of the act is partly depending on which frame we're reading Don Quixote in. What options Don Quixote has when he encounters things is filtered. So Don Quixote's deliberative space looks different. The horizon of his de deliberations looks different than yours would and than mine would because he's bound up in a system of norms tied into chivalry. And how the characters conceive of what their duties are and what sorts of virtues count as virtues, whether or not he's being virtuous or crazy, these things are all, again, frame dependent in, in a certain interesting sort of way. All right, so as you may know, there's a robust tradition of philosophical reflections on the Quixote. Um, so Unamuno wrote a book about this, Ortega y Gasset wrote a book about this, Jose Gauss wrote, wrote a book about this, uh, and even better for my purposes, there's a tradition of reflection, uh, or there's a tradition of writing about the writing of Don Quixote. Jorge Luis Borges wrote, uh, Pierre Menard, author of The Quixote, and a number of people have written about that article as well, or that story, uh, which means that people have written about the writing of the writing of Don Quixote. It's all very meta, and, a number, and so that there's like philosophy about the writing, about the philosophy of the, anyway. Okay, so enormous tradition here of, of thinking about these things. And a kind of natural place, uh, if we're thinking about the history of 20th century philosophy in Mexico, to, to, to start with is Ortega y Gasset's uh, Meditations on the Quixote, first published, I think, in 1914. And, um, and, and in this text, it's one of, uh, uh, one of Ortega's first major writings. And in this text, he uses it as a vehicle for thinking about place, philosophy, and the nation. 
And place and philosophy, you can see why. I mean, the things I was just pointing to are about Spain as a place, about chivalric practices, about the idea of uh, what, it is, uh, what it is that's going on when we have these social practices operating in this kind of way. And, and for Ortega's purposes, he's interested in using the meditations um, uh, on the Quixote it partly in the service of a very culturally focused philosophy program. He's very explicit about this. He says that part of the reason why he wants to think about these things is because he thinks that a central task for people who are interested in the state of contemporary Spanish culture is going to be for them to go back and to revisit that history. And as he puts it, I'm not going to get the quote exactly right here, but it's something to the effect of what we need to do is we need to go back open up those old veins and inject some new blood into them. And it's only in virtue of injecting new blood into them that we can transform the significance of contemporary Spanish culture by transforming how we understand the significance of our own history. And this is the line that Ortega takes at the beginning of the meditations uh, about why he thinks it matters to go back and read uh, El Quixote and why it matters to go back and think about the intellectual, the, the intellectual history that is central to, to Spanish culture and Spanish identity. And this produces uh, the most famous bit of this, this uh, work, at least here in Latin America, um, the idea that uh, ends up becoming known as circumstantialism, and it's the quote uh, here, I've got it rendered in English, I am myself in my circumstances, how can I save myself if I don't save my circumstances? And you can see this is part and parcel of the cultural renovation project. Right? So how can I save contemporary Spanish culture if I can't save the circumstances of, of contemporary Spanish culture? And that involves a sort of history ladenness that he wants to be able to say something about. All right. Um, other things that are going on in the text that you should know about. Uh, so here, uh, so Ortega's views about some of these things change a little bit over the course of his career, but at least in 1914, you can see a, a robust commitment to historicism, a robust commitment to, uh, to idealism of the kind of post-Kantian sort, and a commitment to perspectivism. The perspectivism stuff tends to uh, is pretty uh, front and center in the meditations. In some of his later work, the perspectivism goes away, uh, but, uh, but it's there. Um, so I mentioned these uh, pieces because they're going to matter in a moment here for some of the history that, that comes out. Uh, so as, uh, as I imagine many folks in this room know, and if you don't know, you ought to know because we're in Sala Gauss right now, <laughs> listening to the Gauss lectures. Um, so Jose Gauss uh, was a student of Ortega a very uh, faithful and devoted student of Ortega, um, who comes during the Spanish Civil War to Mexico uh, and uh, takes up a position and then subsequently trains a couple generations of philosophers here in Mexico, and that's why his name's everywhere. Um, so uh, he, he too wrote a book, uh, El Tema del Quixote, uh, on, uh, on Don Quixote. And, uh, but part of the reason why uh, it, we have to talk about Gauss in this context isn't just because of the room and the nature of this particular set of talks, uh, but also partly because uh, Gauss's arrival had a certain kind of sea change effect on, uh, on the history of 20th century philosophy in Mexico. Um, now, it didn't come out of nowhere. So anybody, anytime anybody tells you that there's a sea change in some or another set of, of an intellectual milieu, there's always the secret underside of the version of the history that gets overlooked. And some of that is that Caso and Vasconcelos and Ramos had already been paving the way for something like a cultural renovation project. And uh, they were already interested in questions about uh, wh what is it to do philosophy from Mexico? What is it to do philosophy from Latin America? And so when Gauss comes bearing these Ortegian thoughts about the importance of cultural renovation, the importance of philosophy grounded in place, historicist and culturalist kinds uh, of inclinations, it found ripe and fertile ground in Mexico to take off in that sort of way. So he arrives in 38 and he makes Ortega absolutely central in his teaching. And because Gauss wasn't stupid, he explicitly connected it to uh, intellectual projects that were already going during the time. So he provides an, uh, a review of the second edition, for example, of, uh, of uh, Ramos's profile and says one of the really great things about uh, Profile of Man and Culture in Mexico is that it anticipates and, and carries many of these Ortegian themes. And since Ortega's right about everything, now we're off to the races. Okay. Um, by the mid-1940s, uh, 
and, and overrun, oh wait, I got to use my technology here. Overrun, there we go. Um, so uh, you can contest that bit of, of vocabulary, but by the 1940s, a lot of philosophers in, uh, in prominent academic positions in, the, uh, in Mexico uh, had been heavily influenced by Gauss and the Ortegian tradition, uh, and they were in various shapes, ways, forms, committed to versions of historicism, culturalism, and circumstantialism. And this is what was the kind of groundwork for the creation creation of a Filosofía de lo Mexicano, an attempt to do philosophy that was about Mexican cultural circumstances and to give an accounting about what the nature of it was to be Mexican. So one kind of paradigmatic example of this is Seas 1952, Conciencia y Posibilidad del Mexicano. Um, and in this uh, work, you just see lots of these Orteguian and Gaussian themes emerge. So for example, Sea, he recognizes, so he fr actually frames this in a very interesting way. Um, and this is something that I think ne that, that is kind of ripe for people to take up this question and think a little more about it. But he recognizes, so he, he notes, he says, look, Science and philosophy have given us ample reason to be skeptical that there is an essential human nature, uh, or a simple essential human nature, and one that is in some or another sense kind of floats free and independent of social context. And so the philosophy he's thinking about, of course, is this is going to be stuff that's influenced by the, the culturalist uh, Gaussian historicism and, uh, and some existentialism. But the science he's thinking about is also just the rise of work in, in psychology and sociology that's suggesting that, that there are all these interesting differences in how human societies set themselves up and the kinds of dispositions people have that look like they're partly a function of context and place and local incentives and, and the development of historical patterns. And so, so he says, against this background, that we needed new accounting, our new picture about what human agency looks like. And so, Say and his friends uh, go to look at the local intellectual context. They say, look, if we want to understand something about uh, consciousness and possibility of, uh, of the Mexican, then what we need to do is we need to look and understand the social, cultural, historical context of, of, of Mexicanness. Now, you might think, well, yeah, but what kind of project is that going to be? And here he says, are we Mexicans right to propose a problem such as that of the essence of the being of the Mexican? And notice, the essence of the being of the Mexican here is framed against worries about whether or not essentialism is even true at all. Okay? This sometimes gets lost, I think. But, and he says, are we in a philosophical field or have we abandoned it, passed on to another, to psychology, anthropology, or sociology? So back in 52, but, uh, uh, Seaf foregrounds the thought about, look, is it even possible for us to undertake an interesting philosophical project about Mexicanness, or are we just doing science? That's the question, right? It, um, and, or, or to the extent to which we're, maybe we're doing something like proto-sociology or proto-anthropology. And if that's what we're doing, why are we doing this in a philosophy department? Right? That's the question he's pressing. Um, well, so the result that comes out of, the, the answer that's given to these questions is, well, no, look, it's okay for us to do this in philosophy because what we're doing in philosophy is we're doing ontology. And ontology sounds really fancy, and so we can claim to do ontology because nobody else is going to say they're doing ontology. Yes. Right? Um, <laughs> we have made the, the investigation into our local cultural and historical circumstances safe by calling it ontology. Um, so, for example, we get from, this is uh, Villoro in 1949, uh, he says, we transition from psychology and historical research to the ontological inquiry of reality itself. I mean, footnote. Uh, um, so what does he think psychology and historical research are doing? Um, uh, yeah, well, right. So, I mean, but so this, is, so this is one of the things I think is super interesting is to try to piece together what's the relationship between the kind of broadly cultural historicist, sometimes phenomenological tradition under which these figures at this time were working on and the conception of what science is and then how we might think about these things today. So future project, future work, somebody else, please go figure that out and let me know. Um, so here the idea though is he says it's about developing a categorical, categorical system of its own that provides the reasons for the elements of our psychology and history, bringing those elements back to the ontic characteristics that underlie them. And so this idea that what we're doing in a kind of, in a cultural analysis is we're providing a kind of ontology, we're providing a set of fundamental categories. This shows up in all of these figures who are members of that group, the Hyperion group that, uh, that uh, Sea uh, uh, organizes and uh, including Uranga that we talked about last time. Uh, and so this is the, the, the kind of background intellectual context. The nature of the ontology, 
Crucially, it's historically and contextually situated. Right? So this is a crucial bit about how the ontology is supposed to go on this account. Now notice, there is an alternative relationship you could think, at least one alternative, a lot more, uh, to how the, what the relationship of this ontology is to social science. So uh, Jose Revueltas, for example, in 1960 says, look, the problem with the Filosofía de lo Mexicano is it got it all wrong. Um, the ontology, the idea of the ontology, it turns out it's entirely reducible to, the, to history, colonization, and class. And so by the time we've accounted for those things, there's nothing left over to distinctively talk about cultural ontology. It all just reduces to history, colonization, and class. And notice the Villota model goes the other way around. That is that what we have are these sciences, sociology, economics, and so on, that those things are invoking certain kinds of tacit categories for which we can do a kind of ontology of those things, and then those are the things that show up at, at, at this next higher level. So it, it, on the Villoro model, the Filosofía de lo Mexicano is ontologically prior to these so social sciences, and then on, on the Revueltas model, it goes the other way around. Okay. So uh, for the rest of this talk, we're going to settle which one's the true... No, we're not going to do that. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so, here's a, so here what I want to do now is just quickly, because uh, I want to flag this, because we're going to come back to it later on. I want to flag and recognize that there are actually a couple of different varieties of philosophical commitments that went under the banner of culturalism and, uh, and circumstantialism. So one is a kind of the, the model of what culturalism came to as a kind of activism or engagement with one's concrete context. So Ortega talks this way, Sea talks this way, uh, Filosofía como Compromiso, for example, Sea is very explicit about this. And they're the kind of existentialist overtones about, look, when we're doing philosophy, philosophy is about, it's both from a kind of set of concrete historical conditions, but it's about engagement with sometimes transformation of those circumstances. Uh, in contrast, uh, a different kind of view, and this is one that you see, Ortega also has this view, but it's very important for Gauss, Villoro, Uranga, and Portilla, uh, that the, it, where the idea is it's not necessarily committed at the first pass, though, again, ambivalence about this, and here these are generalizations and you can contest some of the particulars, but um, it, it's uh, less obviously a, a story uh, that is uh, about uh, a kind of philosophical activism, though it could be that too, uh, but more centrally about just giving an accounting of the social, social or cultural ontology of a time and a place. Right. Two different projects, one kind of activisty, the other uh, kind of quasi-descriptive. All right, both versions tended to travel with perspectivism, so um, of the Ortegian sort, and especially historicism. Villoro is actually an exception to this. So, uh, so Villoro in 48 uh, has this passage where he's talking about the, the, the what is it going to be to undertake a, a project of Filosofía de lo Mexicano, and he says something like, yeah, we now need to rethink how we're doing these things and to hell with historicism. Uh, so far as I can tell, he was the only one of the Hyperion group who said, uh, uh, who held that view at the time. I think everybody else, so far as I can make out, was, was a historicist. Um, so, uh, so all of this is in the background about the, the subsequent rise of Filosofía de lo Mexicano. Okay, so now we're going to do 15 years in one slide. You know, we're going to hit the accelerator on the intellectual history and it's going to be okay. Um, all right, so by the mid-1950s, lots of people are really worried about the Ga Gaussian package of culturalism, that is, philosophy is about uh, a particular culture, historicism, that truths are always historically indexed, perspectivism, that is, that the fundamental nature of ontology is not necessarily unified, but it's about uh, the kind of... Uh, uh, all there is to reality are individual perspectives that contain in, uh, internal structures but that may not overlap. Uh, and circumstantialism, where the idea is that in some or another kind of way, uh, what it is to be the kind of thing you are is a function of circumstances. Okay, That's the package. By the 1950s, people get worried about this. So. One worry is that the Gaussian package itself goes in exactly the direction Gauss himself went. Um, so Gauss, uh, as you may know, uh, ended up maintaining a kind of view in the mature version of his view was something like uh, philosophy is just kind of personal confession. It's, uh, it, there's no hope for a kind of universal or trans-historical truths that really philosophy is a kind of reflection or representation of the kind of particular historical, cultural, perspectival position of a given philosopher. Um, so if you were interested in things like universal or trans-historical truths, the Gaussian project was going to seem really narcissistic and solipsistic to you. 
Okay. Now I'm not saying that it was, but I'm just note that's going to be a kind of natural reaction. Um, and there's a worry about a kind of essentialism that, that people, there's a kind of complaint that people made about things like a project of Filosofía de lo Mexicano that were essentializing a cultural or historical moment. Footnote, everybody who's internal to that project has got to reply to this objection, but this was the objection that was frequently made, um, that it was a kind of essentialism. And, uh, and then I think, you know, one of, a really kind of elegant challenge for the view, for, for people who were attracted to circumstantialism and the idea that somehow stuff um, outside of the head played an important role in the construction of one's agency. Uh, Frondizi has this uh, wonderful line where he says something like, so remind me again what the boundaries of my circumstance are supposed to be. Is it my nation? Is it my religion? Is it my uh, neighborhood I happen to live in? Is it the person I get my tortillas from? Uh, no, he doesn't say that part. But, the, but that's the, the, the kind of pressure that he, he asks is, OK, so what the heck is a circumstance? What bounds the circumstance in some or another way? To different degrees and in different ways, the Gaussians start abandoning ship. Uh, and meanwhile, lots of other folks begin to express reservations about philosophical presumption. So there's a fight with Nicole in 1950. Villegas writes in 1960 about the problem of truth in his kind of overview about what happens to the filosofía de lo mexicano. And the arrival of analytic philosophy in Mexico yes, uh, cements the reputation of uh, the, uh, sorry, the repudiation of the culturalist and circumstantialist project. Right? So analytic philosophy arrives, uh, you know, uh, you guys can tell me this history better than I could tell you. Uh, Russell and Wittgenstein and Davidson and Popper save us from the predations of those Gaussian phenomenologists, historicists, culturalists. And finally, truth can now break out over the land and, you know, tr and trans-historical truths, not just local truths about Mexico in 1950, but truths for all time and places. And then Philosophicas is born, and then <laughs> a few years later, there's a f uh, an invite to some guy from the United States who comes and says, wait, but I want to talk about some of those old things. Okay, so, uh, so a uh, quick footnote here, uh, Jorge Gracia, uh, my sometimes collaborator, uh, he uh, um, has written a, a bunch about the kind of the metaphilosophical fights and ways to think about what's going on in some of those metaphilosophical fights. And I think the framework here that he provides is a kind of useful way of thinking about what some of the main options were uh, and in fights that kind of spanned all of Latin America in different ways. So uh, on the one hand, you have the culturalists. So these are oftentimes historicists, but folks who think that philosophy is always from a particular cultural position, Gauss, Zaya, the Hyperians. Uh, notice many of the Hyperians stopped being Hyperians so later in their career, they're not part of the same cluster. Um, the criticalists here, he's thinking about like Salazar Bondi, maybe Dussel. Um, so, uh, and, and the thought here being that in, in, amongst these folks, that the idea is what it is to do philosophy requires certain kinds of conditions. And if those conditions obt don't obtain, then you can't provide and can't do genuine and authentic real proper philosophy and according to these folks especially you know the the view was at least up through 1970 roughly philosophy had never existed in latin america anywhere including in mexico why well because conditions conducive to autonomous independent uh, non-colonial thinking just hadn't ever obtained. And so that was the big project, is what would it be to be able to think independently? Uh, and so uh, on this sort of view, uh, the, uh, the answer to the question about when does philosophy start in Latin America, the answer is about 1970 in Argentina, I think. Um, that was the view. I'm just reporting, OK? <laughs> um, so. Uh, as you know, my view is that it started a, a few hundred years earlier. Um, okay, so, uh, and then last, there are the universal, uh, universalists. And these are by reputation many analytic philosophers. These are folks who think that, look, primarily what we're doing when we're doing philosophy is we're not trying to do kind of local, uh, local culturally uh, focused uh, enterprises. We're trying to understand the nature of the very fabric of reality. We want to know what free will is. We want to know what justice is. We don't want to know what free will in uh, uh, in Roma in 1952 was, what we want to know is what free will in all times and places would be. Um, we don't want to know what injustice is in Tepito uh, in, in 2019. We want to know what justice is full stop for all human beings everywhere. Okay. All right. Um, that's the project. So, but here's the thing. Okay. So, so I think uh, I like Gracias taxonomy. It's not perfect, but I think it, it does a, a good job of mapping some of the big camps 
who it is that talks to each other and who doesn't talk to each other in philosophy, and what their complaints are about the people who want to make the wrong kinds of hires. Right? So, so I think it's very helpful in that way. But here's the thing I think that has gone largely underappreciated is that at least some of the historicism versus universalism, and here I'm going to just cluster the criticalists in with the culturalists, even though it's not totally fair to do that, but at least some of the historicism universalism disputes were, to my mind, deeply, deeply ill-conceived. That is, people were picking teams and, and joining up on teams on the basis of a certain kind of unnecessary disagreement. Here's the claim. So I think Everyone needs a theory of contextual intersubjective or conventional truths. Footnote, Gracia doesn't actually disagree, though a lot of times people read him as disagreeing with this. So that is, whether or not you're a universalist or whether or not you're a phenomenologist, whether or not you're a culturalist, whether or not you are a hardcore analytic philosopher who thinks it's no good if you can't put quantifiers on it, you still need it to be the case that you've got a class of contextual intersubjective or conventional truths. Right? You still need it to be the case that there are such things as marriages and felonies and money and dot, 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 right? which is a very complicated way of saying everybody needs a social ontology. Right? You, can't not, you can't not have a social ontology because otherwise you have a hard time explaining why there's such a thing as the Gauss lectures at an institution that is the UNAM in a country that is Mexico. Those are all elements of a social ontology and you need a story about those kinds of things. And the thought is, look, Sure, there's absolutely a real dispute about whether historicism is true or not. Right? That's a real philosophical and substantive philosophical dispute. But whether or not you have that fight and whether or not you are committed to that fight, it doesn't preclude you being able to have convergent interests in social ontology. And that's true even if you're a universalist. You can still be interested in the question of social ontology. So whether you're a culturalist or whether or not you are a universalist or whether or not you're some other kind of thing, everybody's got to have a cultural ontology. Now, I think there's interesting questions about whether or not regional or historically specific ontologies can generalize. Right? So that is, you might think the culturalists were on to a very specific kind of ontology, the ontology of mid-1950s uh, Mexico, and that was the, the social ontology that they were trying to provide an account of. But then there's a question about does it generalize at all? Well, so last talk, lecture five, was partly about reasons for thinking that you could generalize at least some of that machinery. Maybe not all of it, but at least some of it. All right. So... I want to switch gears. Now that I've said a few provocative things, I want to go switch gears to an entirely separate subject matter that I swear has absolutely nothing to do with anything I was just talking about. OK, we're going to talk about Anglophone philosophy of agency. So for those of you who were hoping for analytic philosophy or expecting it, now, finally, lecture six, you're going to actually get an extended bit on analytic philosophy. OK. Um, so, uh, in classical analytic philosophy, um, so this is uh, in, in, in Anglophone philosophy of agency, um, and here by philosophy of agency I mean roughly the, those branches in philosophy that are concerned with the nature of human agency, so principally philosophy of action, uh, but also maybe the free will moral responsibility debate, and also things like uh, parts of moral psychology, parts of philosophy of mind, uh, things that are in various ways trying to explain what the difference is between roughly things that are able to undertake action and things that aren't. So if we start with a kind of old Davidsonian idea about a difference between actions and events, uh, we can carve up the world as, as, as partitioned in this way, and some branches of philosophy are interested in the agentic part of it. Okay, um, so in, in, on the classical versions of these things, uh, what you have is an emphasis on what now gets called the BDI model. Um, the idea is, the thought is, we can account for all the major features of agency in terms of beliefs, desires, this was the Davidson model, the beliefs and desire model. Bratman comes along and says, well, actually, it looks like we uh, need and, and get benefits from adding intentions to our, our psychological stockpile. Uh, but the idea is that the BDI model is this incredibly fertile model for trying to explain and understand human action. That is, if you want to understand why people do what they do, you need a story about what their beliefs are, you need a story about what their desires are, and these things will oftentimes then produce an intention, and then the intention guides and directs the action. And that's the basic model. And it's an enormously fertile model because you can explain just an enormous swath of what human beings say and do with these relatively rudimentary looking tools. 
And there are ways to soup it up. So you can do things with higher order attitudes. So for example, Frankfurt made a, uh, you know, spent the 1970s uh, working out what, uh, what happens if you start thinking about desires as being hierarchically structured, where you could have desires about desires, right? So I might desire to uh, have a glass of mezcal right now, and I might also desire that I don't have a desire to have a glass of mezcal right now. I start thinking to myself, well, maybe I'm an alcoholic if in the middle of a talk I'm thinking I really want a glass of mezcal, right? And so, so I can have desires about my desires. And Frankfurt uses this to, to really expand out an interesting story about the complexity of human agents. Um, and, uh, and maybe we add a few more uh, uh, other mental states, but that was the basic approach in philosophy of agency. So, so for any of you who've read any work in philosophy of action over the past 40 years, it was going to look like that. Okay. Um, it's parsimonious, it's capacious, and it's sufficiently rich as to be able to give us accounts of action, free action, free will, autonomy, identification, internality, and externality. Right? So the people who are working in this tradition, they gave us accounts of these kinds of things. Now we might disagree with some of the accounts in different sorts of ways, but this is the sense in which it was a very rich tradition. And in many ways I think it's a model of what a successful analytic uh, research program ought to look like. Why do I say that? Well, because the basic BDI model ended up being super important in artificial intelligence research. It uh, had extensions into work in primatology and, uh, and in developmental psychology. It's been used to model what's going on as a theory of law. It's arguably had as big and rich set of payoffs in other kinds of collateral fields. I think this is in one sense you might think it's a really good test of a philosophical research program is does it generalize? Does it turn out to be useful for people who weren't interested in those initial projects? And I think by that standard, philosophy of agency is maybe one of the most successful research programs in analytic philosophy full stop. Okay? It's had a certain kind of generalization that is unusual for philosophical research programs. I'll defend that. Come fight me on that one. But I'm happy to defend that, uh, th defend that line. Um, OK, but it's philosophy. Which is to say that there are objections to how the research program has unfolded in various kinds of ways. And so here are a handful of challenges to the classical model. Joint action. So how do you account for joint action if all you've got are the beliefs, desires, and intentions of a single agent? Uh, collective action. So Bratman and Gilbert have kind of expanded this out. Uh, worries that it's too atomistic, it's insufficiently relational. You can't account for the complexity of human shared relations, and that's not unrelated. Uh, also autonomy under oppression. So how do we explain uh, our very different kinds of judgments about whether or not you do something when you're under oppression or not? Uh, Self-abnegation, the possibility of adaptive preferences, the idea that preferences are socially endowed, uh, worries coming out of social science research that it turns out that, uh, that uh, factors that look like they're deliberatively irrelevant and rationally irrelevant drive behavior, automaticity about the, uh, our unawareness of the things that in fact drive our behavior, uh, and the role of implicit attitudes in shaping what actions we do, the effects of scarcity on, on what you deliberate about, and your, your attentional resources. So Jennifer Morton's been doing some really interesting work on this. Uh, worries about how to handle culpability under oppression. So that is, we think very different things about who's at fault and not. Uh, which, which are the agential capacities that ground freedom and why or, uh, and responsibility? So some people in this room have been working on that. I'm fond of that work. Uh, a lack of control over the social meaning of actions. That is, we act in certain kinds of ways and what the significance of that act is that we do. We don't always control. And if you're a member of the wrong group, the act can get interpreted in the wrong way too easily. So all these are kinds of things that people have pointed to. And I think one of the really interesting things that's happened to work on agency since the 2000s is that it has expanded partly to try to address some of these worries about the classical model, about whether we could do everything we wanted with just the materials inside the head. So the thought is, has been that we have to supplement the classical story of agency by appealing to things like context, social relations, norms, institutions, and practices. And this requires, of course, maybe an empirically informed psychology. So philosophers, if you want to have a good story about agency, good luck just sitting in your armchair anymore. You have to actually know something about the real and actual constitution of human beings. I'm sorry. Um, but, uh, but we also get uh, we, we need a story about the ways in which culture, society, norms, and practices structure agency. Because otherwise, good luck having a good account about the nature of agency. All right. So wouldn't it be nice if there had been a tradition of philosophers <laughs> thinking about the social and cultural dimensions of agency from which we could draw inspiration? 
those of us who are bound up in contemporary philosophy of agency. I don't know where we could find it. I, probably nobody's ever done it before. Okay, so here's the upshot. Um, so at the outset, I said I want to convince you that the history of Mexican philosophy is good, even for philosophers principally concerned with contemporary philosophy. So that is, if you're sitting in this audience and you've been foolish enough to come to now my sixth lecture, whether or not you cared at all about the history of philosophy, I've been trying to convince you that knowing a little bit about the history of Mexican philosophy would be of some use to you even if you don't work on, on historical topics. So one response to this goes something like this, and I'm imagining that like, at this point there are people for whom I've already lost and so they're not sitting in the room, so you can tell them I was talking about them. I don't know who they are, but just tell them I, I was talking about them. One response might go something like this. Well, that might be interesting, but for anything of interest in it, we can surely find a better version of it in existing analytic philosophy. Now, I know this thought has crossed people's mind before. Um, so here's an initially snarky reply. Wow, I'm so impressed about your confidence that analytic philosophy has thought about all the possible conceptual innovations that human beings could ever have had. That's amazing. And it's false. Um, okay, so, uh, but here's a more conciliatory reply. Analytic philosophy, I think, is, is admittedly good, if imperfectly good, but I think actually quite good at at least the following sort of thing. It's good at mapping conceptual possibilities within a set of assumptions, right? That is, define a set of assumptions, give analytic philosophers a couple decades, they'll work out every possible permutation and combination of views that, that exist within that concept space. And I think that's a non-trivial contribution. That's a real thing and it's important and it's something that those of us who are trained as analytic philosophers, we're trained up to be good at doing that kind of thing and that's our stock and trade. But the history of philosophy is oftentimes full of different assumptions and ignored versions and parts of the history of philosophy are especially promising places to look for packages of assumptions that are gonna produce different kinds of conceptual configurations. And I think this is the thing about analytic philosophy is that we're really good about figuring out within the assumptions we take for granted what, the, what possibilities could look like, but that gives us a set of conceptual innovations that's gonna look different if we had different background alternative possibilities that are gonna generate distinct conceptual configurations. And I think this is one reason why we need to have historians of philosophy, even if we are ourselves primarily interested in doing uh, research in contemporary analytic philosophy. We need historians because amongst other things, they are caretakers of an enormous repository of very sophisticated human thinking about subject matters where the assumptions and the background assumptions are different. And this can sometimes generate insight and it can generate possibilities that might otherwise be invisible to us uh, because certain kinds of things just get hidden by ass uh, assumptions and the configuration of them. So here's some proofs of concept about this thought. So I think Vasconcelos' mestizaje story, the significance of cultural ideals and of not just tolerating diversity but actually trying to think about what it would be to build a social order that requires diversity, I think is one case in which here's a set of possibilities that just haven't been systematically pursued within the context of, uh, of contemporary analytic philosophy. Or if you don't like that one, there's Zuranga's accidentality in the architecture of culturally structured agency. Or if you don't like that one, I wrote a book. <laughs> and notice, here's the hint, the central innovation in that book is called Circumstantialism. Chapter seven, go read it, buy my book. <laughs> or download it from Libgen. Okay, so. I get to say that only because it's actually not on LibGen. I think I'm the only person who's got a, a, a book on free will that's not on LibGen. Okay, so, um, you know, it's, it's shameful. Um, okay, so, so here, here's the question. Um, the, so, so the question is this. Um, I think there's an interesting possibility for a certain kind of philosophical integration open to us. My advice is, let's not fight about historicism, but let's make use of ideas in, in the older social ontology. For example, we already know from this prior tradition that selves can stand in complicated relationships to a context. We've seen people work out socially and culturally specific situations and how they structure the contents and values in our deliberative landscapes. That is what seems to be deliberately apparent to us. We've seen people who are committed from the outset to the view that stuff outside of our head structures the social significance of kinds of agencies. So my thought is just this. Why don't we make sure that our new theories of agency are responsive to challenges developed 75 plus years ago in the culturalist tradition? That's the invitation. Okay, here's an example of how that could go. Here's the kind of the story about circumstantialism I, I, I offer elsewhere. So I think the tough part for traditional circumstantialism is to identify which circumstances are those that constitute the relevant ones. 
at this, uh, the kind of Frondizi gives us as a kind of the, the silver bullet that's supposed to kill the Gaussian project. So here's one solution is you might think, well, look, let's just rec restrict circumstantialism to particular agential capacities and let's tie those to particular practices. So we don't need to have circumstantialism be true about everything all the time everywhere. We can just say, look, what we want of circumstantialism, what we want of the idea that, that context and circumstances structure agency is that it structures parts of agencies or kinds of agencies. And what kind of agencies? Well, agencies that are embedded within a practice. So how do you tell that story? Well, my interest was in moral responsibility about how to come and to recognize and respond to moral considerations. And there the, the account goes something like this, to say that you're able to do X in a sense that's relevant for culpability and nothing else. It's tied to the practice of culpability. For an agent to do X in a practice-dependent sense of deliberatively relevant circumstances, um, that's the idea, is to be able to do X is roughly for an agent to do X in, uh, in, in the relevant, the practice-dependent sense. Uh, and the relevant circumstances here are specified by the practice that has the following profile. Its norms, statuses, when internalized by agents, are ideal for producing agents that suitably respond to moral considerations <coughs> in the actual world. And we can make this super fine-grained and technical, and I can talk, talk to you about nearby possible worlds and how to measure proportions of worlds and so on. And we can give you all of the kind of traditional tools of analytic philosophy for grinding out the nitty-gritty particulars. But the important part here is just, look, there's an interesting set of resources, the circumstantial contextual nature of our agency. We do need to fir firm it up in various ways, but we've got the tools to do it. The constraints on what norms and their contents are only partly about social efficacy on the story I tell, so things like motivational backing, human cognitive limits on norm granularity, that is how fine-grained are, are the norms that we can internalize, and the ease of internalizing, all these things matter for telling a good story about responsibility, I think. Okay, so some upshots. I saw this yesterday, it was hilarious. It was this, like, two, it's a, they're on a break, and in a moment, True love is found in the shadow of this monumental statue. Um, this is a beautiful moment. Okay, so here's a thought. What an agent can do is not a function of agents, but agents and circumstances. That's just the Ortega, yo soy yo y mis circunstancias. Okay, uh, we get a practice and context dependent notion of ability that's sensitive to material conditions, to things like normative effectiveness. It gives us tools for handling real world cases where context seems to matter. And it requires attention to circumstances that are conducive to forms of agency that we care about. So here's the thought. Look, if you want to do good philosophy of action, you want to do good philosophy of agency, one of the things you need to do is you need to think about what are the contexts or what are the institutional structural arrangements that produce the kinds of agencies that we care about, All right? And that's a very different research project in some sense than one that atomistically just says, focus on the contents of what's inside people's heads. All right, quick thought about extending this project. Institutions are tools for stabilizing expectations and deliberative possibilities. I'm just ripping this straight out of Portilla. Um, somebody who had read uh, Mexican philosophy and was working on philosophy of agency before I did would have beat me to this idea, but I'm claiming it now. Ha. Okay, so second, uh, most of the hardest problems for the theory of culpable wrongdoing emerge in cases where institutions are failing and norms of pro-social uh, norms, pro norms are failing. So Carlos is writing about this, Fernando's writing about this. I think these are all super interesting cases and it turns out there's a tradition of people who were interested in just this question. They had different tools, <laughs> but we should read them. Okay, so. Is this thing I've been doing, is it a Mexicanizing of analytic philosophy of agency? Is it an analyticizing of culturalist philosophy? I have no idea. And I don't really care. But maybe it's just philosophy. Okay. Here's my not so secret agenda then. I want to blow up the old canon. To hell with all the old canonical thinkers. Fortunately, canons aren't static and are properly responsive to our interests. The canon will change anyway. And I think we're all going to do better philosophy if we've got a wide set of philosophical histories, concepts, and tools at our disposal. And by this, I don't mean that everybody's got to know the entirety of the history of philosophy. Um, the idea here is this is supposed to be a kind of network point, that we need networks that are richly populated by people who think about these things from different standpoints. But we are going to need work to do a good job of reading those figures. Right? Um, so uh, I'm not saying that canonical figures aren't worth our attention. Go ahead, keep reading Kant. Um, Heidegger, maybe even Heidegger. Uh, so, uh, but some non-canonical figures also merit attention. That's the force of the argument. Right? Okay, I know I, I've held you here for a long time, but do you want to find out about the future history of Mexican philosophy? <laughs> okay, well here it goes. Here's the future history of Mexican philosophy. 
You might think, maybe it'll be a philosophia cosmica. <laughs> All right, see, this joke is only funny now because of, yeah, okay, so here's what I think, ha! Utopic <laughs> futures are always most plausible when they're remote, right? Um, so I think, look, there is a genuine appeal in a philosophical community unbounded by the accents of a particular culture. That is, it would be awesome if philosophy was uh, informed and unbiased enough to just pull from whatever thoughts are interesting, valuable, powerful, no matter where they are. I'm not sure that's the world we live in, but I think that would be a great world to live in, and maybe it's a future worth fighting for. I don't know. But presumptively, and this is the point I was making earlier, the value of something like this is going to be at a network or community level. It'd be crazy to think everybody has to be, has to be a specialist in everything. That's not, that's not the demand. But the conditions for this are going to be super delicate, I think. So it may require affluence, because after all, if you're, like, you know, there are only a finite number of positions. There are lots of interesting things that are worth studying. Why should we have people study uh, you know, Sanskrit philosophy? Why have people study, uh, I don't know, Shunza? Um, and partly, you're going to need enough resources to be able to pull it off. You might need a diverse community of educated global elites in order to pull this off. I don't know. Uh, and you might need large populations with a reason for interest in some of these other philosophical histories in order to have enough institutional force to be able to continue to support the studying and teaching and reproduction of these kinds of things. So maybe you can't get that everywhere. Small footnote, you might think this is part of Vasconcelos' point about why you need diversity in order to maintain uh, equal access to cultural achievements everywhere else. But that's a complicated issue. Okay, so I think it's unclear whether or not any place will have conditions like that for long enough to pull this off. But you know, the point about utopias isn't necessarily to get there, but to animate how you think about things. So what's the future of the field going to be like? Well, I think success is going to depend on more than reports about who said what. Right. I think that it, it can't just be ideas, but evaluation of them. It can't just be cataloging of ideas, but it has to be about developing and extending and transforming ideas wherever we find them. Um, so here's a worry you might have about this. Yeah, but what about the problem of defects? So what do we do about all those Mexican philosophers who were jerks, sexist, racist, classist, anti-democratic, and so on? I gather some people have had this worry about the history of Mexican philosophy. <laughs> so this is my favorite worry about the history of Mexican philosophy. So I think, well, let's just ask ourselves about the other philosophers who were sexist. And I think, well, that's pretty much everybody before 1960, except maybe Sor Juan and I'll just say three others. I don't know who they are. <laughs> Okay, well, how about other philosophers who are racist or bigoted? Uh, well, so that's Aristotle, Hume, Kant, Hegel, Frege, and really everybody before 1960, except for maybe Las Casas after he apologized. Um, I don't know. How about other philosophers who had really bad political views? Well, I think that's pretty much everybody before the 19th century. They're all like, divine right of kings is a great idea. Um, and lots of folks afterwards. I mean, if bad politics were sufficient to get you kicked out of reading philosophy, I mean, like, we'd never have to read Plato or Aristotle again. Um, some of you are like, that would be great. Um, so, uh, but, but notice, I mean, we just lose, uh, lose our canon here. Any philosophers who've been personal jerks? I mean, basically everybody who's not in this room has been a jerk. Um, so, I, so I just think, like, if this is our standard, we get rid of the entire canon, right? And so one question to ask yourself is, if, if we don't apply these standards to other philosophers, why do we apply them to Mexican philosophers? Okay, so hashtag no heroes. I get this from uh, Liam, uh, Liam Bright. Uh, he's got this great idea about hashtag no heroes in philosophy. Um, I think, look, our focus should be on ideas, not people. I think, unlike most people, ideas can be reconfigured, rehabilitated, deployed in new ways and in new contexts. And that's why we need to do our histories of philosophies in ways in which we're focused on the ideas and not the people. Um, I, say, I say, don't worry about the people, do worry about the ideas. Here's a hypothesis. Footnote. I'm not committed to this, speculating it could be true. We mostly overlook the terrible, wicked, vile, evil, unhappy, infelicitous, and embarrassing features of canonical figures in philosophy because of the fact that they're already canonical figures. That fact legitimates our attention to their philosophy. What it does is it allows us to ignore their humanity and to focus on the ideas in their work that we still find valuable. So, we could just make the people we have a problem with canonical 
and then we could focus on their ideas. Okay, so uh, where is the future of a Mexican philosophy located? Ideally, Mexico and everywhere. I think anybody who can contribute should contribute. Uptake of work should be meritocratic and presumably pursued by an egalitarian multinational community. Plato belongs to everyone, so should, and then insert any one of the figures I've been talking about over the two weeks of my lectures. The reality, of course, though, is that even if good work is, let's hope, a necessary condition for uptake, Access and attention is always going to be mediated by other things, network position, availability of work, what's perceived as philosophically promising or in style. M variable material and structural conditions exist. I mean, the structural conditions here are quite good. See, like that's solid concrete. Um, yeah, so, um, so the... Uh, they, I really, I'm very envious about their, their pools. Like, you guys need, like, the ponds of water here, here too. I mean, like, so it's time to take back the rectorship. Okay, so, uh, so, um, so what? Um, so I think there are big advantages here in Mexico to the study of Mexican philosophy. Um, the language, the text, the expertise, but there's comparatively minimal incentives, I'm told. Right? In contrast, uh, intellectual and demographic changes in the U.S. Academy are driving an appetite for philosophy outside of the traditional Anglophone world. So I think here's a near future. A near future is this. In the United States, there's, I think right now, a very interesting ongoing reconfiguration of, of analytic philosophy. And I say analytic philosophy in quotes not because I don't think that there is an analytic philosophy, but rather because the, at this point, a kind of ma massive pluralism about methodology and substantive commitments and so on is just the order of the day. So, um, so what it means to be an analytic philosopher is just that other analytic philosophers recognize you as an analytic philosopher. It's a kind of network effect. Um, now, I mean, here's just by way of example. I mean, so this is a kind of a handful of recent texts that give you a sense of what the kind of great expansion of attention has looked like. Uh, so there's the Van Norden Manifesto, Taking Back Philosophy, a Multicultural Manifesto. You've got this interesting podcast about a history of philosophy without gaps, where the attempt is to try to, do, uh, to look at the history of philosophy everywhere on every continent and to do a full history of that, one that doesn't just, isn't just selective and Eurocentric. Uh, Justin Smith's got this volume about uh, six different versions or typologies of philosophers that have dominated in different eras and different times and that have very different kinds of intellectual profiles. You get works like uh, Serene Cater's Decolonizing Universalism, a transnational feminist ethic that is an attempt to try to think through what does feminism look like uh, if you're looking north-south and not just uh, looking within uh, affluent uh, countries that are members of NATO. Um, the uh, Owen Flanagan Geography of Morals is trying to understand what the scope of different kinds of configurations of moral possibility look like across the planet and not just within uh, a kind of Eurocentric conception. And then recently from Oxford University Press, uh, this wonderful volume by Sanchez and Sanchez, Mexican Philosophy in the 20th Century. And this is just a kind of sampling of, of recent work in, quote, analytic philosophy by major mainstream presses uh, uh, that is uh, attempts to kind of think through what a different curriculum looks like, what a different canon might look like. So, uh, so that near future, I think we're eventually going to get a new equilibrium that identifies uh, um, what works have the following kinds of features for them, that is, that are, quote, respectable. Right, whatever that means, that are tractable for teaching, because everybody's got to teach, and, and what people think is canonical is partly a function of just what was assigned on their syllabi. And it's going to be relevant for current and near future debates. And so I think right now the great opening that's happening within contemporary analytic philosophy is not going to last forever. New equilibrium will emerge. There's going to be a new set of canonical texts. But I think it's not implausible to think in the current climate of expansion there are going to be new figures that get retconned into respectability. Retcon is a word that comes from comic books. So in comic books, there was the idea of retroactive continuity. So the rule in comic books was always you want to preserve continuity, but sometimes you have to go back to tell a good story and recast what had happened. And so you insist that these new events uh, really had happened in a complicated way before. And so I think we're going to get figures that get retconned into respectability. And I think in this context, the history of Mexican philosophy could actually have a chance of getting a certain amount of respectability. And some of its figures could become part of the intellectual background in the US academic world. Lots of things would need to happen first, though. Do we want that future? Notice, if I'm right, that's a future in which the history of Mexican philosophy becomes part of analytic philosophy. I'm inclined to think that's a good thing. Your mileage may vary. But it's way in my mind. <laughs> 
your mileage may vary. Um, an ideal future. Yeah, I guess that's a, 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 a U.S. centric metaphor because, you know, sometimes you don't keep track of mileage. Okay, so uh, kilometrage. Um, all right, so uh, my ideal future, an egalitarian collaborative international community committed to mutual engagement, and serious critical response. There are, I think, real challenges, and I don't want to pretend that there aren't about distance, languages, differences in locals, incentives, and norms. We've come part of the way. Maybe you'll help us go the rest of the distance. That's it. Uh, I want to ask about uh, the philosophical activism that, did you, that you mentioned before and how this could be part of the, that kind of near future of analytical philosophy that you uh, also mentioned in the last part of your talk because uh, there is also this new picture in the analytical philosophy especially in the U.S., about reconnecting uh, theoretical issues with social issues and very real problems uh, related to oppression and uh, things that are, are happening now. How you can reconnect all the things that you said about SEA and the, uh, philosophy as a com compromise and engagement with the uh, real issues that are happening in the yeah, thanks. This is a great question. So, uh, I mean, the this the way too simple answer is to say that uh, it's up to you. I mean, that is. Uh, I think the, there's a way in which what the future of philosophy looks like is what are its uh, what are its earliest practitioners, the early career practitioners. What are they interested in? What do they think matters? Because I mean, that the, the future of any field is always to be found in uh, in the, the the sort of relatively early career in grad school and immediately after, because these are the folks who. 25 years from now will decide what the field looks like. So, I mean, so in some sense, I really do want to own that, that thought that, that uh, is there a way to connect these things and so on. And I think that the answer to that is, well, sure, if you want there to be. Um, but, but on the more kind of concrete a, a, a answer to the, the question, I guess my own views about this are that um, I just, so uh, I guess I, I'm a bit, uh, uh, I, I want to be dogmatically undogmatic about this. I mean, that is, I, I think that it is important that we have a intellectually diverse space internal to philosophy where there are some folks who think uh, are committed to something like the philosophy as praxis model, where the, the entire point of philosophy is an enterprise that is to uh, undertake transformation of the world we live in and to make it a better place. And I think that's a, a mode of doing philosophy and I don't have any objection to, to people wanting to do that and, and undertaking that project that's very much in the spirit of doing something like a philosophy as a kind of commitment to a way of living into a way of, of social transformation. On the other hand, I also don't want it to be the case that that's the only way we do philosophy. I think uh, I think a healthy world in philosophy is one in which there's just diverse conceptions of what it is for us to, to pursue philosophy and uh, what it is that we're doing. And if there are folks who just think, look, I don't care about changing the world. I just want to understand things. I want to see how they hang together. I think that if that person doesn't have a space in a philosophy department, uh, we're doing things wrong. And so I guess th that's the sense in which I think let the many flowers bloom here. And uh, for people who want to resurrect uh, and pursue the, uh, uh, intentionally political projects and who want to focus on the ways in which lots of stuff is unintentionally political, but in fact reflects a kind of tacit set of political commitments. I'm all for that work, and I think it's important work, and it helps illuminate things that we don't oftentimes have. I don't think it's the only work there is to be done out there, but it doesn't have to be. Thanks. Once again, thank you. Very thought provoking. I really, really, really like this talk. Especially because I felt very interpolated. Yeah, interpolated. Yeah, interpolated. Yeah, interpolated. Yeah, interpolated. Uh, as a Mexican analytic universalist philosopher who has defended the defect argument against this. And I'm going to do it again. I'm sorry. I still, yeah, I, was, I, was, I wasn't convinced. And um, so here's, here, here's, here's my take. 
I think it's very important to separate two claims that come together in the way you presented uh, your position in this, in this last talk. One is the Mexican philosophers that were useful to you and your project mm -hmm. as a philosopher of Hades. So it is accidental that for you it was the canonical Mexican philosophers that were used. And I think that's very, 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 very important. Because we don't, I, I think it's very important that we know that that doesn't mean that for other philosophers in other philosophical projects uh, where the most, more useful, useful and uh, uh, Mexican philosophers are going to be the canonical one, right? They're probably going to be some misfigures or somebody who is not yet. Okay? So, and, and that is very, 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 very important because the usefulness of the canonical uh, figures to your project don't mean that that is the. That it generalizes. That their can yeah, exactly. Yeah. That their canonicity has anything to do with their use. On the contrary, I think your argument should be better read as oh, they were useful to me despite their being canonical. Because I think canonical is bad, generally. Mm -hmm. Canons are horrible stuff. I mean, canons are just, you know, it's a generalization of, yeah, I, I, well, I do believe that. I yeah. believe canons are evil. And, um, and yeah, just re re reinforcing the, the canon that already exists in Mexico, I don't think that's something I want to do, right? Mm -hmm. So I do want uh, Mexican philosophy to become mainstream. I do believe Mexican uh, uh, philosophy is, is just another philosophy, or at least Mexican Olympic philosophy is another philosophy, period, and a lot of Mexican philosophy is another philosophy, period. But I would like to extend the, the ex exhortación a que, se, a que no se lea nada más a los filósofos mexicanos canónicos, que se, así como se está criticando, así como se está cuestionando al, al canon eh, de la filosofía analítica anglófona, creo que nosotros también tenemos que criticar nuestro propio canon. ¿no? Creo que es importante reconocer que la historia de la filosofía de México, la contribución que hemos hecho los filósofos mexicanos es gigantesca. Eh, y las filósofas. Perdón, las filósofas. Yeah, Thank you, Fanny. <laughs> yeah, so I so good. So um, so a couple of different pieces here. Well, while it's on my mind, I actually want to pick up the the point that uh, that Fanny was raising. So I, I do think um, so. Here's one point at which I think I I felt keenly um, some degree of um, unhappiness about the traditional canon of philosophy in Mexico is that I think it is a very curious fact the, uh, that the widespread absence of, for example, uh, women philosophers, philosophers who were not centrally at some significant part of their career based in Mexico City, or in, at the UNAM in particular, and so on. So I think there are lots of ways in which the, can, that the traditional philosophy canon in Mexico um, refl uh, reflects uh, certain kinds of presumptions that I think are worth uh, asking about again and reopening and trying to understand whether or not there are other alternative versions of the traditional history that would be valuable for us to to tell or to retell or re-understand or to borrow my favorite phrase from Ortega to inject new blood into old veins and see if we can recast our histories in certain kinds of ways. So I think, um, so in that sense I think uh, there is a good reason to think about um, to think about uh, the uh, whether or not the formulation of, of, of the traditional canon has features that we should be leery of, and and my talk did my talks have done very little to reconfigure that canon, um, and so I think that's that's an important thing to mark and to note. Another thing partly related to this, and I think this is part of my own um, my own concern about the growth and development of the field. So the the talk was already too long, so I dropped a bunch of slides. But one set of slides was partly about my worries about how the configuration and growth and development of this field uh, will go. Mm -hmm. So I think Mexican philosophy is a growth field right now in the sense that there are folks interested in wanting to write and translate and, and do work in this area. And But I think that the one worry about this is that um, that only some versions of that history will go through. And whether it's yeah. the, the gendered version, whether it's the ones that exclude uh, analytic philosophers, whether it's ones that include analytic philosophers, I, here, I mean, this is gonna be unsurprising coming out of my mouth at this point, but I guess I just think 
the more the better. I want an expansive conception. I want the, the maximal Mexico in the story, and that includes philosophers of a very wide range of stripes, and some of whom are activisty, some of whom are deeply committed to pure theoretical inquiry with no concern about what practical upshots follow, and, and folks of a wide range of, of intellectual orientations. And I think a, a healthy tradition uh, is gonna be one that has that kind of configuration. Um, so. Okay, so so last piece, I'll, and I'll try to say this bit, last bit quickly about the, let's not run together uh, the, uh, the autobiography of Manuel's thinking uh, with the, the wider general utility of people doing this. So I think that's a fair objection to make, but I also think of it as a, yeah, but this is also proof of concept about what the value is of having um, understudied, because where I come from, uh, there is no tradition of studying Mexican philosophy. Um, and so I guess I think uh, that in this kind of context that uh, it's, it's meant as an example about somebody for whom uh, I had, there was no reason to think there was gonna be anything there for me that turned out to be super interesting and super valuable. And I think that's just a general feature about understudied histories is that you get configurations of these kinds of things. And, and so then you can say, yeah, 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 but it doesn't follow that I actually am gonna get anything from going back and rereading, uh, you know, Sor Juana on, uh, on limited skeptical theology fair, but this is why I think the other point about, look, there's a kind of systemic point here about, um, about we need communities that read broadly and bring different resources to bear, and that seems to be an important part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Bueno, gracias, Manuel. Uh, voy a preguntar en español. ¿Está bien? Um, um, me gusta me gustaron mucho tus, uh, tus seis pláticas eh, pues. cada una me gustó más y más, más. Eh, <risa> y um, quería preguntarte porque creo que no tocaste esta cuestión aunque a lo mejor tal vez en la primera eh, si te preocupa ser anacrónico o no si, si mm. has pensado um, que tu uso de la historia de la filosofía mexicana eh, pueda ser tal vez cuestionado como un uso anacrónico yeah, so uh, I am absolutely committed to doing anachronistic philosophy, um, and unapologetically so. Um, I think that uh, I think there are lots of modes under which we do the history of philosophy, and uh, and I don't think any of them need to exclude the possibility of usefully doing any of the other ways of, of thinking about history of philosophy. So, for people who want to read the history of philosophy entirely and exclusively for the purpose of understanding what I don't know uh, Le Leibniz thought within the context of when Leibniz was writing and how Leibniz himself understood these kinds of things, and for which practical consequences and practical payoffs for our contemporary thinking are utterly irrelevant and beside the point. For folks who want to do that, I think that's a valuable project, and people should do that kind of project. But I also think there are other ways of thinking about what we can get out of reading the history of philosophy. And, uh, and I'm very deeply committed to thinking that one use of the history of philosophy, it's not the only use, it's not the only thing that's valuable, but one use is to read it for the purposes of thinking about whether or not it helps us think about the problems that are alive for us right here and right now. And in that sense, I unapologetically read the history of philosophy anachronistically, but I try to be, recognize that fact and to foreground the fact that when I go back to read these figures, I'm coming at these texts from a different historical, cultural milieu, a different set of preoccupations, and then I go and read these things, and I am, in many of these texts, explicitly trying to do a reconstruction, where the idea of the reconstruction is not look, this is the way the story goes relative to their own kinds of views, but here's a way we can take those ideas, develop them, build on them, use them, explore them, and that's its own kind of project. And so I think if somebody wants to object that this or that piece of my reconstruction of, you know, Sepulveda or of Uranga or whomever is, uh, is, is anachronistic, I think, yeah, that's why I told you it was a reconstruction. That's why I said this is an attempt to do things with the ideas that may not be the things that they themselves were interested in at the time at which they were writing. But the, the sense in which I th still think it is a version of the ideas these figures were doing was partly because 
that's the source of these ideas. And I want to be respectful of at least some of the structure of what they were doing, even if I'm not fully respecting all of the particular nitty gritty details of it. And I submit that's most of what we do when we read historical figures. It's not like when we go back and read about Kant and talk about uh, the universalism implicit in the categorical imperative. It's not like we also tend to remind our students, oh, no, 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 but he actually only meant Europeans. Let's go read the stuff that he wrote about Africans or when we, I mean, we, we just don't do this. When we talk about what the, what's the virtue of the Nicomachean ethics, we don't start off by, and we don't re repeatedly remind our students, no, 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 he wasn't talking about women. Um, the, the Nicomachean ethics is just for uh, uh, slave-owning landowners in a city-state. Um, and what we, we redeploy the history of philosophy all the time in the way in which we read it and teach it. And we acknowledge these things oftentimes along the way, right? whether it's Kant's racism, Hegel's racism, the sexism of dot, 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 dot. We do these things along the way, but, it's not, it, but, but we think of that as a tip of the hat rather than the principal focus in a lot of the history we do. Again, exceptions duly noted. So. Uh, I didn't understand exactly what you mean. This is my first point, um, my first question about exemplarity, validity. Mm. And the second is, it's only a, a, a personal intrigue. <laughs> uh, what is your difference? Because in your book you speak about circular socialism. Mm -hmm. And I saw in, uh, in uh, Wikipedia or something like that, that your book was under this uh, description, Secure Socialism. And uh, I, uh, I wonder what is the difference for you between your Secure Socialism and, for example, Ortega and Gauss. Yeah. Good. So, um, so the idea of exemplary validity here, this is just a, a, it's a term from Arendt. So Arendt introduces the idea of exemplary validity uh, and uh, Hannah Arendt? Uh, Hannah. Arendt. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so, so uh, and, and her idea there is just um, that, that the mark of certain kinds of really compelling work um, is that oftentimes it bears both the marks of very historically specific, culturally loaded particularity. But at the same time, paradoxically, despite the fact that it's got all of this historically, culturally specific particularity, uh, that there's some universal resonance or recognizability about it. And I think, um, and, uh, and so it's in that context that I think, by, by that sort of metric, uh, Don Quixote has this, you know, in, in an enormous way. And I think that, that's what I meant to pick out by that the thought. Um, the uh, the second point about the how do I think about the relationship of my circumstantialism to Ortega and Gauss? Um, so uh, so I guess so uh, so I think um, it's at least a family resemblance and maybe a uh, a, a species genus distinction. Um, so I think. So here's what I think that, that the kind of Ortega-Gauss circumstantialism got right. So I think that it got right the idea that, our, uh, that, that important and large swaths of our agency uh, is a function of the circumstances under which it is uh, developed and enacted. And for them, it's not just a developmental point, but it's about the, the ongoing enactment of, of one's agency. And so I think that bit is, is right. Now, I think um, I might disagree with Ortega and Gauss about the scope of that kind of claim, whether or not it's all of our agency or some of our agency and so on. Um, and so the, the way I'm inclined to think about circumstantialism is I don't know whether or not I should think circumstantialism is true about all forms of agency that human beings have no matter the domain but I think it's uh, very promising as a kind of model for thinking about what the kinds of capacities are that are that matter for our finding one another morally culpable for action 
And there, this is a circumscribed version of circumstantialism, where the idea is that, that we're going to hitch our story about capacities to uh, features of context, where the features of context include things like normatively structured practices. And then those together, as it, the way I think I put it in the book, is something like um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the basic features of the agent plus the social normative contextual features jointly uh, pick out or identify or construct uh, the properties of agency that then matter for the purposes of the practice. And so that's the sense in which I think whether or not that's a, a species or a family resemblance on circumstantialism I think partly depends on how broadly uh, how broadly you want to construe a requirement that somebody think that all forms of agency have that structure or whether or not you just think it's just parts of our agency and I'm neutral about whether all but committed to the at least the responsible agency has that structure gracias otra vez Manuel en español este hoy si lograste generar una suerte de enojo raro, por lo menos en mí y esto fue pasando a lo largo de las distintas pláticas y la verdad es que hay que agradecerlo porque eso no suele pasar en este en este escenario por lo menos, sí. entonces gracias <risa> <risa> pero tengo tres puntos que voy a tejer el primero es que no entiendo por qué o sea, tienes un punto específico que es, miren cómo hay ideas de la filosofía mexicana que siguen siendo pertinentes para pensar problemas actuales de filosofía analítica y creo que esa fue un poco la línea todo a lo largo de, de las lecturas eh, sin embargo sigues hablando de la filosofía mexicana entonces si tu punto es correcto no, no veo para qué seguir hablando de la filosofía mexicana es decir, qué sentido tiene ponerle el apellido si de verdad la agenda, el, el, la aspiración es que sea tan filosofía como cualquier otra filosofía ¿Para qué sirve el mexicano? Ese es el primer punto. Entiendo que hay algo, un sentido en el que podemos hablar de filosofías locales, que es el tipo de preguntas o la manera como formulo una pregunta respecto de un problema, debería, por lo menos en principio, estar guiada por mi entorno. Es decir, el tipo de cosas que pasan en mi entorno motivan cómo formulo mi pregunta. Entonces puede ser que, que, que tengamos preguntas sobre el mismo tema, pero que las formulemos distintas y que el diálogo consista precisamente en ver que es el mismo fenómeno e ir construyendo una visión universal. Pero, pero no veo que haya otro sentido en el que podamos hablar de filosofía estadounidense o filosofía mexicana que no sea ese. Eh, si ese fuera el caso y si pensáramos que cómo articulas las respuestas a las preguntas te da el apellido, entonces creo que seguiría viendo este desequilibrio entre localismo y universalismo o, o seguiría por lo menos todo el tiempo jugándose un ir y venir entre esas dos cosas eh, y por último el tercer punto que tiene un poco que ver con esto es que el problema de los localismos y los universalismos y, y creo yo en particular que de los universalismos es que en realidad la agenda de la investigación la dicta el poderoso el que tiene el dinero, el que tiene las revistas, el que tiene la, la lengua en la que, que se hace la disciplina. Eh, y entonces, eh, pues está muy bien lo que deseas, pero la verdad es que si no como que pensamos y transformamos ahí sí esa relación de poder y esa idea de, de, de localismo, entonces pues no, no veo cómo va a pasar tu... tu uh -huh. Okay, good. So there's a lot there, and I think I'm going to not remember all the pieces. But uh, so, le but let me see if I can get some of this. So, um, so, uh, so one of the things that uh, that animates this project uh, and this series of the the lectures I gave here um, is the thought that. Uh, that there's a body of work in the history of philosophy that has been neglected in my own education, um, it, uh, not because of its contents, but because of the language it was written in and because of the place where it was written. 
And, uh, and so the thought is something like, well, I could try to write a book about all um, Sp uh, Spanish language philosophy. I could write a book about just Latin America. Um, but these were going to be projects that exceeded my uh, abilities and expertise to pull off. So I needed a handle, a base, a principle by which to select a collection of work to use as a exemplar or as an example about how if we look at forgotten histories, we look at uh, histories that aren't taught in at least the places I got educated in, that there are powerful and interesting ideas there that are useful for us to do philosophy with. And, uh, and what I could do was to write one about the philosophy of history in, or the, sorry, the history of philosophy in Mexico. And so that was tractable. But, uh, but I do think, or quasi-tractable anyway, um, but I do think there's no reason why the, the basic underlying principle can't and shouldn't be expanded. And I think that other people should take up this question about, so what else is there out there that, that is worth reading? And that it should shift how we think about what the categories are and what are parts of our canon. But I think that the fact that it was written in Mexico is absolutely part of the explanation about why it was not taught where I went to school and why it was not a part of the intellectual inheritance that I grew up with. Um, so I think, uh, so I think that's, that's part of the answer to number one. And I, and I certainly, well, this is not meant to exclude the possibility of a, other uh, joining and overlapping projects. And I think over time, as things, um, as conversations emerge, uh, for students, what should happen is, uh, if I got lucky, what will happen is that people will just stop thinking of these, uh, these figures as uh, some separate or radically distinct part of uh, uh, intellectual history or something, uh, but instead that this is just part of their own intellectual canon, the figures they read and interact with. And we still talk about Greek philosophers and German philosophers because it's a useful handle for picking up and talking about things in the world. But, um, and people do teach classes on British philosophy and German philosophy and so on. So I don't think that we need to be bashful about that. But I also think uh, that, uh, that it's going to be okay if people end up um, reading and talking about the work of these figures in a way that's detached from national narratives, that's fine too, and that's one way for the project to succeed. Um, okay, so that was the first question. Um, the, uh, the, the th let me go to the third question about the structural things. Um, so I agree, there are all kinds of structural barriers to how, and that explain, uh, structural features that explain how people do philosophy, when they do philosophy, which figures they read, and so on. But this is why I think it actually matters right now, at least for one of the communities I'm a member of, the, in, in mainstream, anglophone, analytic philosophers in places with PhD programs that are producing the next generation of people who'll be working in US universities, the, um, there is this, in fact, sociologically super fascinating moment going on right now where people are curious about what is there that was not part of my education that might be interesting to go and read. And that's a real thing. And that's a real thing that creates the possibility for taking up questions that weren't taken up. And it's also a real thing that, uh, and I think this is uh, here just to point to a demographic truth, that at least in parts of the United States, curriculum is driven by um, what students want to take. And philosophy departments are getting hammered across the United States on enrollment. And one kind of answer to the question is, are we teaching philosophy that matters to students who are paying sometimes exorbitant amounts of money uh, to be able to study? And there are a lot of different reasons why people want to study what they do. There's no one reason, and I'm not sure there's always good reasons for why people want to study what they do. I mean, why are all of us here? I mean, one answer is going to be because we had this irrationally positive reaction to a particular teacher, to a particular way of teaching, to a particular class, to the person we happened to be in a study group with when we first were in that. I mean, there's all sorts of irrational things that got us to fall in love with philosophy. And for some folks, maybe it was just, you know, I read the critique and that may, first critique just transformed my life and the synthetic a priori is what I've been looking for all my life. But for many of us, we get into this discipline for all sorts of irrational reasons. And one of those irrational reasons, sometimes for some students, goes something like, 
hey, uh, wouldn't it be cool if I took a class where one of the authors, just one, give me one, on my syllabus has a Spanish surname. And that's one thing, it's not the most important, not the only thing, but it's a thing that actually drives some curriculum decisions. Or wouldn't it be great if I took a philosophy class and it turned out there was a woman on the syllabus? Or wouldn't it be great if I took a class in philosophy and it was about the difficulty of making hard choices under conditions where you, yeah, da, 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 right? And so start to full, you know, flesh all that out. And that, that's part of why I think it's not crazy to think that what people will be reading and teaching 80 years from now will look very different than what it looks like right now. And part of that's gonna be a function about what choices we make with our own research, with our own teaching, with our own classes right now. I don't remember what the second question was. <laughs> Eh, la, se la segunda pregunta es sobre el equilibrio o, o la falta de entre el localismo. Ah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, um, so I guess I just think on this question, I'm not going to have much useful to say, I guess. I, I think I really don't care about this debate. Um, I don't care about this debate. It's a real debate, and it's a genuine debate, and it's a substantive debate. And historicists and universalists are going to, you know, hate each other for as long as there's opportunities to do so. Uh, and, uh, it, but I don't think, I guess I just think, look, we don't need to settle those debates in order to be able to usefully read each other's work, especially those of us that are interested in agency and social ontology and so on. And so we could fixate on that debate if we want, but that uh, seems like a terrible use of our time if we, what we're trying to do is productive work. Um, and maybe it's not a total waste of time, but I think it, it is, a, you know, that my, my sense is the history of philosophy in regions where this fight has loomed large haven't actually produced a lot of convergence. But I do think that there is this possibility of usefully reading each other's work. Now, would talking about these kinds of things in some way, shape, or form, uh, do are we necessarily re-entered back into these debates? I just don't think so. So I'm agnostic about the historicism universalism debate. I just don't have a view about these things. But, it, but I th do think that um, I don't have to have a view about these things in order to be able to fruitfully reread the Filosofía de lo Mexicano. And, uh, and rereading that doesn't commit me to an answer on the universalism historicism debate. Um, but what it does commit me to is social ontology. And what it does commit me to is social ontology that's going to be circumscribed by geography and time and so on. But good luck having an adequate social ontology that doesn't make those commitments. And that's the sense in which I think we're all committed to, to the resources that we need in order to be able to read this stuff. But like with everything, it's easier to read it if we've had teachers and secondary literature and so on that help us see our way through. So if we want, we can keep fighting the same old fights that we've been fighting for 70 years, or we can do some other, something else. And that's part of what I want to invite people to do. Fabio? Este, yo quiero regresar al asunto del anacronismo porque me sorprendió un tanto, bueno, en cierta medida me sorprendió la respuesta, porque, el, bueno, sí y no, porque la manera en que lo pusiste es que a mí lo que me interesa hacer, tú dices, no es historia de la filosofía, es filosofía. Entonces lo que me interesa es como sacar las cosas de ahí, de esos pensadores que a mí me interesan, que a mí me sirven, y no me interesa tanto como ver los detalles de exactamente qué es lo que estaban diciendo, por qué lo estaban diciendo, o sea, el detalle que, que hace historia de las ideas intelectuales, historia de la filosofía, como que poner, tiene que atender, ¿no? Uh -huh. Pero esa manera de ponerlo es simplemente falsa, ¿no? uh -huh. y, y de, e invita a reproducir uno de los vicios de cierta manera de hacer filosofía analítica, que me parece a mí que es muy mala idea eh, continuar, ¿no? Con ese vicio, ¿no? es agarrar las ideas de aquí y aquí como si hubieran salido de ningún lado ¿no? y prestar poca atención a quién lo dijo, cómo lo dijo, por qué lo dijo eh, porque claro, o sea, cuando uno eh, retoma las ideas de un pensador del pasado yo creo que es muy buena idea tratar de entender lo mejor posible desde el propio punto de vista de lo que estaba diciendo para que uno no acabe simplemente eh, atribuyendo cosas que en primer lugar son falsas y que a fin de cuentas si uno no lo hace, no se toma ese trabajo de, de reconstrucción fidedigna lo más posible, entonces uno realmente que, que es uno de los vicios de algunas maneras de inclusión analítica, está uno en su propio, soli no, no solipsismo pero sí continuando con tu mismo pensamiento y proyectando lo que tú quieras encontrar ¿no? entonces 
por eso digo que es eh, falsa la dicotomía que pusiste. Y el, los ejemplos que diste son muy aptos para ilustrar porque esto está mal. Eh, tú decías, bueno, dice, eh, si leemos a Kant, eh, no nos interesa ver, saber que pues en realidad estaba hablando de los europeos, en realidad estaba hablando de los hombres, es universal. No, yo creo que es algo que tenemos que saber, que tenemos que decir y no perder de vista esto nunca. Es algo que las feministas han hecho al leer a los pensadores políticos y dicen, a ver, a ver, fíjense bien, está hablando de los hombres, está hablando, no, es cierto, terrible. Y si no lo... No, pero estamos a, si, si, si no lo estuviera haciendo de esa manera, la teoría no le sale. Y, y han explicado por qué la teoría no le sale. ¿no? Ahora, en el caso particular de la filosofía en México, me parece todavía más grave cometer este tipo de error. ¿no? En mi experiencia personal, al a mí me interesa entender ¿no? cómo entender el liberalismo en México hoy en día, cómo entender la laicidad. Y me parece que es muy importante para esta tarea voltear a ver lo que han dicho los mexicanos sobre esto históricamente ¿no? pero claro, esta tarea es fructífera en la medida que me tomo el trabajo de tratar de entender entenderlos lo mejor posible o sea, desde qué perspectiva estaban hablando qué preguntas estaban planteando cómo las estaban respondiendo porque lo que tienen de originales es en eso en que estaban dando respuestas a preguntas que eran de ellos que estaban motivadas por sus circunstancias, por su contexto, por su situación, y que no eran preguntas que se podían formular en otras situaciones que eran diferentes. Y si no me tomo el trabajo de entender eso, de entenderlos en sus propios términos lo mejor posible, estoy reproduciendo uno de los peores, o sea, de esos vicios de los filósofos analíticos que van a llegar a las ideas, y que lo que están haciendo es proyectando su propio pensamiento y fallan en engaging really the thinker they are claiming to be style. Entonces, por eso, la manera sí. que lo pusiste es simplemente falsa, me parece a mí, y, es, y, y mal, ¿no? Good. Ok, so this, acuerdo, this is the kind of, um, the, the kind of, uh, robust criticism I, I very much welcome. Um, so thank you. Um, so, uh, so, let's see, so, I, I know it's going to sound like uh, what I, the uh, so I'll preface what I'm about to say by acknowledging that it's going to sound like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, um, but I don't think we disagree. Um, here's the the so I think that there is a short term and a long term project here. The short term project goes something like this: How do you get a group of people to care about something they don't already care about? And I think the worst way to get a group of people to care about something they don't already care about is to say, let me tell you a lot about a bunch of things that you don't already care about. Um, I think the best way to get people to care about stuff they don't already care about is to try to anchor it in things for which they already have live concerns. And so I think at the first stage of doing this kind of work, it is super helpful to just sit down and walk people through why, given the kinds of projects we find ourselves with right here, right now, why it might be useful to think about, read, throw into your intro philosophy class, throw into this, that, or the other kind of thing, uh, have some familiarity with this set of ideas. But I think that's the first taste, and the first taste is free. That's a, it's a, it's a bag drug dealer joke. Um, it's after that, after people think, oh, that was kind of interesting. Um, oh, that helps me understand. Um, that you get people who go back and then want to look more carefully at the details and to unpack the details and to get it right. And so I do think there's a way in which am I feeding analytic philosophy its vices? Absolutely. Um, I think so. Um, but I think that's part of, at this kind of stage, part of what has to happen in order to get people to uh, take on board the project and its interestingness at a certain kind of level. But this doesn't exclude other ways of, uh, other ways of getting in and getting into the trenches. And I do think there is a kind of level of granularity about all of these sorts of things, about where do we want to pitch our tent, about um, how much detail and how much historical faithfulness is required. And there are some projects for which I think it's super important to get people to think about exactly all the vices of, uh, of Kant and the Kantian project and what are the pieces that we've overlooked. Um, but I also think 
those kinds of projects, uh, they are very important for our understanding of our own history, our own understanding of our own intellectual history, our own understanding of what we've overlooked, the presumptions. Uh, these kinds of things, I think, are, are important counter-canonical um, counter -canonical readings that we have to take with us and that a healthy philosophical community has with it at all times. Um, so a small footnote here, my, my colleague Sam Rickless has this, uh, this view that he thinks that what philosophy needs are not just canons, but really anti-canons. We need to be reading against our own canon, uh, and that, that anything short of that is, is insufficiently philosophical. And I think something like that's right. And, and so, um, so all of that is, that's all to say, I, 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 th there's, I was thinking of this as a strategic choice. Uh, but for which the need and possibility of other ways and more, in some sense, more careful and more detailed readings uh, should follow. And what should happen, so in my wildest fantasy, when somebody asks me, so, you know, the, uh, you know they, they say, so what would really happen? Wildest philosophical fantasy. What would really happen, it, uh, you know, it, the, the um, and, 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 and here it is. I would love for 40 years from now, um, somebody to have read this work and engaged with this work and to be able to say with great confidence, um, it's false, it's wrong, and let me explain to you why every single chapter gets every single one of these things wrong because we have these giant literatures built up around these things that shows what our old understanding of these texts and their significance was deeply mistaken. And I think if that happens, then I think that was more success than I could reasonably hope for. Because I think that's how bodies of knowledge grow over time. And so I think that's the sense in which I absolutely, I think, I think we agree about what ideal state looks like. And then there's a kind of more proximal, immediate disagreement about where the effective entry point is. Well, we have three questions more. They are very brief, because we have three or four minutes. But the answers are going to be... <laughs> sobre horas. No, no, también <laughs> Thanks, I really enjoyed the, the series of talks. I learned a lot from them. Um, so unfortunately, I'm going to focus on uh, your presentation of the classical uh, theory of agency, sure. cl classical model of, of agency. And um, I just want to begin by saying that, uh, so I'm attracted to a kind of objection to this model that you didn't mention, which is <laughs> its, uh, its nature as, as an additive analysis or, or, a, or a form of higher orderism. That is, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm attracted to uh, objections having to do with um, the idea that agency is not the sort of phenomenon that can be decomposed into um, uh, factors or lower order factors that don't themselves involve the agency. Yeah. Um, and I just want to mention this to say that uh, it would uh, be interesting or it would be surprising based on your presentation of some of the figures in Mexican philosophy, if uh, they were themselves in the thrall of, of an additive analysis. So I think yeah. this is also another, uh, just sp speaking strictly within sure. um, philosophy of agency, another um, fertile area to, um, to explore these figures. Um, uh, related to this, though, I wanted to say that um, there's something in um, uh, your presentation of the success or supposed success of the classical model that I was less uh, certain of, which is its relationship to uh, research models like in uh, re research programs like in artificial intelligence, which is that um, there was something in your presentation presentation that suggested that um, the, the the success was um, uh, one of yielding certain results that were taken up by artificial intelligence or other related research programs, when in fact we could say it was more dialectical, mm -hmm. but also we could also say more cynically that there was a demand on the part of artificial intelligence and related programs for a certain kind of analysis that analytic philosophy of agency of that era uh, was willing to provide, um, or was, 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 was supplying in, uh, in, in good faith, but, but nevertheless, uh, was supplying a certain kind of model that um, for which there was funding, including funding from, it, it's indisputable in the case of artificial intelligence, uh, funding from the US government during the height sure. of the Cold War. And so that's, that brings us back to Mexican philosophy, which is one of the reasons why it's, it's so uh, important to look to this tradition, which is that we get um, a case of a tradition of thinking about agency that flourished apart from those pressures, ap apart from those uh, those specific uh, economic and ideological pressures that we get in the case of AI and its relationship uh, 
to the classical uh, model of agency. So, yeah, good. Um, so th there's a lot there. I mean, I guess I think, so the issue about whether or not reductionist or anti-reductionist research programs uh, in philosophy of agency, I agree that this is a, this is a, a live and central debate. Um, I will say, uh, um, you know, my sympathies are, uh, so I, I guess I think uh, it's an open question I, I mean, I'm inclined to view it as an open question about whether or not we need anti-reductionism. And so I think, that, you know, this is the state of play is, well, we have to earn the right to think that it's anti-reductionistic, and I'm not yet convinced that, that we've done that, but that's a phil substantive philosophical disagreement. Um, with respect to the research program thing, I, I guess I think, look, um, Bradman was developing the BDI model in a way that was completely independent of work that was going on in AI. And then AI researchers and, and AI researchers then thought, hey, I can use this to do stuff. And I think it's true that were they getting independently funded by the US government because we need uh, weapon systems and so on to, uh, to be able to be reliably deliver the, the warhead to, uh, um, to our enemies. Um, sure. Um, that uh, that's part of the sociological history about how these things develop. But I think the, the here's the general point is that that uh, is only ever going to be a brief blip. The real question about whether or not uh, a research program flourishes uh, against the backdrop of uh, of the fact of variable funding of structures and so on. And I think look, there's lots of room for important social critique here about these things, but. It's going to be against the backdrop of questions about whether or not uh, people who are invested in research projects find it useful to deploy the tools that somebody else developed elsewhere. And that was the point. And I think that's so uh, if it helps, fine, have the AI point that I'll just rest the case on philosophy of law, primatology and developmental psychology. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, any of these, w and, and maybe then you, the, you put pressure on one of these other points, but I think, look, the, the point here is that the, a mark of a successful research program is a kind of either set of consilience or about the ability to uptake and, and run with. And this doesn't mean it's true, but it does mean that philosophers have done a certain kind of valuable work. And that's not nothing. Yeah. Uh, <risa> y me quiero portar un poquito más me toca entonces me voy a dar la palabra y luego hay todavía dos intervenciones de mi de Guillermo entonces eh, yo quería hacer alguna observación eh, con respecto al panorama que nos presentaste de cómo eh, la analítica entró a este instituto <risa> y, y, y lo planteaste creo que en términos digo yo no soy un analítico pero sí conozco más o menos la historia de cómo se introdujo Some of my best friends are analytic philosophers. <risa> y bueno pero el punto es que tú lo presentas como un, eh, una reacción a un localismo no a, a los anteriores a la analítica hablaba mucho de la circunstancia eh, cultural eh, de incluso el personalismo en el caso de Gauss y eh, los filósofos analíticos o la introducción de la filosofía analítica van a hablar sobre la verdad independientemente de la circunstancia. Yo creo que el panorama es más complejo. Eh, de hecho, Gauss a veces defendió una posición universalista. Hay una polémica interesante entre José Gauss y, y, y Alfonso Caso en donde Gauss defiende el universalismo en contra de, de, de Alfonso Caso, que defendía eh, un relativismo inspirado en, 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 en Benjamin Wolf, ¿no? y que, que de ahí salió pues, toda una corriente relativista que influyó mucho a la antropología mexicana. Pero es cierto que Gauss acabó al final defendiendo un historicismo, eh, como diría Salmerón, que lo llevó a un personalismo, de una especie de callejón sin salida, ¿no? porque acabó haciendo psicología del filósofo. ¿no? Eh, entonces, bueno, parecía que estaban sus alumnos legítimamente eh, justificados en buscar eh, otros, eh, otras maneras de hacer filosofía. Y ahí es donde creo que faltó en tu exposición enfatizar que lo que se buscaba, lo que los alumnos de Gauss buscaron en este instituto es introducir eh, como una metodología un lenguaje común que nos 
permitiera como profesionalizar la filosofía. Y de hecho eso fue lo que argumentó Salmerón, que era el director, para favorecer esa corriente filosófica. ¿no? Es decir, es una corriente filosófica que proporciona una metodología y permite hacer una discusión. Una de las cosas que a mí me quedó grabada mucho en, en su informe de los 12 años que fue director fue la impresión que tuvo de los seminarios de investigadores que había, que eran pues un, un caos, ¿no? Es decir, cada quien se reunía diciendo cosas que el otro no entendía y nadie se entendía. Y entonces, bueno la reacción fue, necesitamos profesionalizar el ejercicio de la filosofía uh -huh. y lo que tenemos a la mano eh, es la filosofía analítica la fenomenología ya venía perdiendo fuerza y entonces creo que ese aspecto es importante yeah. porque incluso la recuperación de los filósofos mexicanos pues tiene que ver también con expresarlo en, un en términos más profesionales sure. y esos términos profesionales Finalmente son analíticos. Bueno, dentro de la tradición analítica. Yeah, good. So, no en ¿Eh? No en Villoro. No, no, Villoro tuvo su, 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 su momento. Su intermezzo. Su intermezzo. Sí, ese intermezzo finalmente lo mantuvo a nivel metodológico. No, dos años horas. Y a nivel metodológico sí lo mantuvo. Pero, más o menos más o menos I can tell that my, my work here is done um, you guys can just sort the rest out yourselves um, I'll, I'll come back in 10 I'll come back in 10 years and add a chapter um, so uh, so good so uh, let's see so I do think uh, so one of the pieces about the story I've told that just doesn't show up in this account but uh, or the, the or sorry that one of the, the pieces that's important for the history that doesn't show up in my account of the history here and there's a lot of different things that are missing but I think you're right to note the the, the pressure and concern for professionalization mm. and I think this is you and and it doesn't it doesn't start with analytic philosophy I mean it goes back to the to to the positivists the positivists were worried about how to better professionalize and what what it would mean once it's the case that now freed of the grips of baroque era philosophy what does it mean to do philosophy as as modern philosophers and they were concerned about the professionalization and then why does gauss have such an impact when he arrives well part of it is that he brought a certain level of professionalization and training to his students that wasn't there in the prior generations and this was a kind of felt needed urgent sort of thing and then why does it happen again when you know and why, why is it that analytic philosophy looks like a kind of promise for for further professionalization well partly it's because of the ways in which the fields were developing and where the activities were and so on so i think that that wave of kind of the, the pressure to professionalize is certainly a part of the history. You can't understand the full complexity of the history without the stories about the professionalization and the moments of professionalization. Right. Um, so I don't want to deny any of that. I, I think that that's right. I also, but I, but I do think it is true that, um, so oh, actually the, the one footnote here, because this goes back to kind of partly the kind of, you know, what's the role of canons? Here, I think one role of a canon, amongst other things, is to create a context or a background of what it is that we can take for granted that other philosophers ought to feel guilty about not having read. Which is a very complicated way of just saying the function of a canon is that I get to use these ideas without having to do a lot of background explaining. And that's what the canon does for us. And it can make certain kinds of conversations intelli intelligible that wouldn't otherwise be. And so I do think. The, you know, one of the things that happened in that moment in the 50s and 60s, uh, um, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, is this interesting transformation about who, uh, it, where the, the kind of professionalization is, where people's attentions were shifting, and what it is that they take to be important. And I don't pretend to have told a full story about that. I do think there is the kind of Gaussian era in the history of philosophy. And I do think that when people walked away from the Gaussian era, that my general sense is, and I would love to be disabused about this, that is, tell me I'm wrong, but my general sense is that when the door closed on the Gaussian era, except for a handful of 
cases, by and large, people stopped reading work from that time period, stopped invoking it, stopped using it, stopped relying on it, stopped being in conversation with it. Mr. And again, yeah. So I mean, yeah, that, maybe that's right. But I do think the you know that that with with a handful of important exceptions, I think that's the way the history went. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of this is a is an invitation to think. Yeah, the, the, those projects might have been superseded in various ways, but it doesn't mean that there aren't things that we can't use and learn even now. Bueno, seamos muy cortos porque ya de hecho estamos fuera de tiempo, Milia. Okay, yeah, thank you so much for this talk. I, I really, really enjoyed it. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed it so much, and especially I enjoyed your, um, your contemporary use of, of, of circumstantialism, and, and I am so happy about the fact that you are working on on this, on what the scope of agency of agency of the circumstance should be to determine what agency capacities someone has that that, that 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 matter for moral responsibility and free will. I am so happy someone in your generation is working on this. I think this is what we need it and I'm going to visit all. And um, I have a question that is a little simple and basic, but uh, just. So do you think that um, from an, uh, what you call analytic philosophy or from academic philosophy nowadays, can there anything be said, and I hope you say yes, about uh, whether there's in general liberating and non-liberating ways to engage or to be in one's circumstance mm -hmm. and engage with one's you know, environment, or community mm -hmm. culture, whatever you want to call it, I prefer to call it circumstance. Do you think there's good and bad ways, for example, uh, to do this that can, that, that, that affect autonomy of thought and how it, it, and how it develops. And in particular, I wanted to ask you about two, two things. One is something you mentioned very briefly, which is adaptive desires, mm -hmm. and another is self-deception. Both of these things are usually uh, talked about in, in the free will and autonomy debates uh, as bad things for good reason, because they have uh, brought many bad consequences, um, and, and it's important to talk about those consequences. But I was talking, especially when you were talking about Don Quixote in the beginning. Uh, is Don Quixote, like, for, you, you said at first he was handled by people because they, they realized he was living in another reality, he was schizophrenic or something, if that world had existed. And then, with, you know, interacting with him, I think it's a reading of Don Quixote in this. People uh, saw something that he was aspiring to that was truly true and beautiful, or they or they, they connected with that somehow, and they stopped handling him so much, and they started treating him. Handling him a little bit because it was necessary, because he really completely he needed Sancho there, you know, mm -hmm. right? As we agree. But people started respecting him in a way that I think, um, I mean, I don't know, there's two possibilities. Either he was he was using self-deception in an autonomous way and bringing something good into the world. I think the most plausible reading of that book in particular and on the, on, of Don the, the Quixote's character in particular is he was self-deluded from reading too many books in a way that was, uh, he was a basic of reality, uh, of reality in a way that was a little pathological and not to be trusted to, to form a mm -hmm. new reality. But still, is this a good, or are there, or could there be good examples of self-deception and uh, you know, forming adaptive desires in the process of formation when you really do not have the freedom that we all have, you know, not to do all. Uh, we all pervasively deceive ourselves, and that's important to, to, to you know, to live and and, and do evil every day. I think by doing that. But is there anything? Okay, you know, yeah. So yeah, is there anything good? Uh, anything to learn from academic philosophy or anything academic philosophers should be working on? that could illuminate this question for us, like good things, good, you know, good uses of, of dangerous tools like self-deception and adaptive desires. So I, I guess I'm inclined to think that, that uh, I sure hope uh, academic philosophers can contribute to our understanding of these kinds of things. I mean, I'd be a little cautious, I guess, about wanting to frame it as a choice between uh, good and bad interventions. I mean, I think, uh, and this is a small point, I, I mean, I'm in interested in the question about better and worse ways to construct the ecologies under which our agency unfolds. And I think that that any way of constructing a social and cultural order is going to have 
costs and benefits to it, and I think, uh, and for both individual agency and for collectives. So, so I certainly hope that there are better and worse ways to do this kind of thing. And, uh, but in terms of the kind of particular details about how to think about what's going on with adaptive preferences or self-deception and the ways in which we might fruitfully either deploy analyses of these things or, or structure social worlds to either be parasitic on or suppressive of these phenomena. That's a much longer and complicated answer, and I think that Pedro will um, uh, uh, not uh, let me. Um, <laughs> yeah, th let me do another set of Gauss lectures on this. So, uh, so I'm going uh, so, but we should talk more. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pero yo creo que no hubiera dejado de encontrar con mucha satisfacción ¿no? cómo eh, la astucia de la historia eh, vuelve a, este, a darnos sorpresas cuando un filósofo llamado Manuel Vargas, en el centro de la filosofía analítica norteamericana, se convierte en en un agente infiltrado de la filosofía mexicana <risa> hubiera sido muy feliz Vasconcelos si estar aquí lo hubieras hecho realmente muy feliz ahora eh, la mexicanización de la filosofía analítica es algo que, que la verdad pues sí o sea te, te pone a pensar, te pone a pensar mucho. primero es, eh, es y por eso creo que Vasconcelos estaría muy contento una reivindicación de un, de un grupo este, que ha estado eh, un grupo subalterno en los Estados Unidos ¿no? pues tiene una función digamos este, política, histórica, cultural pero más allá de eso y esto es lo importante yo creo que tu proyecto que lo distingue de otros que han defendido lo mismo es que la filosofía analítica va a ganar por mexicanizarse se va a hacer mejor ¿no? y eso es muy importante Vamos a hacer, en Estados Unidos se va a poder hacer mejor filosofía analítica porque se va a mexicanizar. Y me parece que esto hay que tomarlo con absoluta seriedad. Y esto es lo que distingue tu proyecto de otros proyectos semejantes en Estados Unidos. Pero ahora quiero pensar, ¿qué va a pasar con esa mexicanización de la filosofía analítica en los Estados Unidos con la filosofía analítica en México? ¿No? En, entramos entonces en un nuevo momento, o sea, se abre un horizonte, una ventana de oportunidad para una mexicanización de la filosofía analítica mexicana. ¿Y qué puede significar la mexicanización de la filosofía analítica mexicana? Y aquí, pues, este, es, es muy difícil, ¿no? Este, dejar correr la imaginación. Eh, por una parte de nuevo, usando este, ¿no? una equivalencia con lo que dije sobre la filosofía analítica estadounidense, ¿no? eh, tendremos un acto de reivindicación, un acto de reivindicación político, social, cultural. Pero también estoy convencido de que la mexicanización de la filosofía analítica mexicana va a hacer que la filosofía analítica mexicana sea mejor la, filosofía, la mexicanización de la filosofía analítica mexicana nos va a poder permitir entonces ser mucho más ambiciosos como filósofos analíticos, estrictamente analíticos. Y entonces, creo yo, esa promesa de nuestros fundadores, de Salmerón, de Rossi, de Villoro, de que la filosofía analítica en México cumpliera con una misión civilizatoria, no solo filosófica, sino civilizatoria, se va a poder cumplir. Entonces, con esto acabo, me parece que tu conferencia ha sido muy importante por muchas razones, pero sobre todo porque ha abierto en este espacio de las posibilidades históricas, ¿no? Y, o sea, no puedo dejar de, de hablar de esta manera casi hegeliana, ¿no? para que podamos de repente imaginar escenarios nuevos, y eso creo yo, pues este, deja la cacha ahora en nuestro lado. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Thank you.